John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I f***ing love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that for us tonight. Big job there for Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, Duffy goes Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock'em, sock'em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull- here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, good to be back with all of you fine, good-looking people, and even the homelier ones out there. It's great to be with you folks as well. Monday, August 5th, 2024. It's episode 504 of the Anik and Florian podcast presented by DraftKings. Ken Flo smiling back in the home studio. It looks like 1080p or 4K or whatever. <laughs> Uh, home studio. Does this mean the the month long vacation in South Carolina was over? What's it's going? over. It's all oh. over. Look at the greasy head over here. <laughs> yeah, man. It's good to be back here in Charlotte. You know, it, it's like I get a little antsy when I'm on vacation for so long. Like I kind of want to ah, get home. I don't know. Anyways, it's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Sorry there was no watch party this weekend, but hopefully everybody was able to check out our exclusive first interview with the uh, new UFC welterweight champion, Bilal. Remember the name Muhammad. That is up on the Anik and Florian podcast YouTube channel. We got a lot to get into today. Umar Nurmagomedov stole the weekend. We are scheduled to talk to Michael Chiesa after his big win over Tony Ferguson. Ray Longo scheduled to join us as he does every week. Brian Petrie for the main event challenge and place your bets. And uh, we'll also talk to a good friend of mine, Matty Simo, on the back end as we get ready for the NFL uh, football season. But we begin uh, with Umar Nurmagomedov. Headlines brought to you by Cuervo. Now's a good time to enjoy the tequila that invented tequila. This Umar Nurmagomedov is something else. I can't say his name here on a Monday morning, but he gets past Corey Sandhagen by unanimous decision, 50 to 45, and then 49, 46 times to Ken Flo. Now, I was watching the broadcast on mute. I got a bunch of child care going on, but I kind of felt like Umar won all five rounds. And to be able to dominate the number two ranked former interim title challenger, Corey Sandhagen, like this, I do think it not only speaks to Umar Nurmagomedov's present greatness, but I think it speaks to some potential future future greatness as well. What were your thoughts on what Umar was able to do uh, live on ABC over the weekend? Well, we know why he was the favorite heading into uh, yeah, that. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm right. a fucking I mean, idiot, huh? Jesus. What's that to rest? Uh, well, and listen, the, the guy was undefeated for a reason, and I, I was really curious to see how he would handle um, some of those difficult spots. And he certainly experienced that against Corey Sanhagen. Now, as much as he won that fight, and maybe, you know, it was unanimous across the board. I think there was one judge who gave Corey one round, another one that gave him the second round. So it was first and second round. Right. And I, I had Corey winning probably round one. I think there's an argument for round two as well. Yep. Um, so it was it was a close fight. There's no question about that. But Oftentimes, when we see guys that are a little bit short on experience, when they get in those difficult spots or when they're so used to picking guys up and putting them on their backs, and when that doesn't happen, we see um, you know, chaos ensue. We see panic sit in. That really wasn't the case for Nurmagomedov. And also, it showed that this guy knows how to get it done on the striking ends of things as well. And we can go in on some of the things that I, that I, I would have liked to see from Corey, but Right now, we're talking about Umar, and I thought that he handled the pressure extremely well. He is a multifaceted fighter. He knows how to win rounds, and when it came down to it, he showed up. You're absolutely right when it comes to the close nature of those first couple rounds. And as we often say here on the podcast, just because you have a close fight doesn't necessarily mean it was difficult to score or there wasn't a clear winner, right? It can be close, but it can also be clear. Mm -hmm. And dude, I love the respect that Umar is getting, like even on Wikipedia, right? It says that this fight was a UFC bantamweight title eliminator. Now, perhaps it was given that distinction because Dana White did say after the fact that Umar is going to be next for the winner of Sean O'Malley and Marab Dwalish Willie. But, uh, you know, this Nurmagomedov name rings true, but I think the focus really should be on the athlete here, Kenny. And because we're going to spend the bulk of time on Umar, let us get to Corey and some of the things that you felt sure. uh, he could have maybe done a little bit better or more of to uh, to get the job done in this spot. 
Well, first of all, we have to go back to his fight against Aljamain Sterling and talk about some of the mistakes, or really the mistake that he made against Aljo. Um, and here, he did a phenomenal job of being a, a very high-level anti-grappler. I don't think there's a whole lot of people in that division that would be capable of not only stopping the takedowns of Nurmagomedov, but also be able to get him off the back in the manner in which he was doing that. You know, uh, everything from those funk rolls to those ba back escapes to those get-ups back to his feet showed that this is a completely different Corey Sanhagen who has been really working very hard on the grappling side of things. And, you know, a, a huge credit to his coaching, Ryan Hall being one of those guys who has worked very closely with him on um, improving his ground defense and his capabilities there. Um, I, I thought that was on full display. Looked great there. However, nullifying what someone's trying to do is good, but countering it and getting on top is even better. And I think that he missed out on a couple of those opportunities to either land ground and pound from some of those countering uh, of the takedown defenses and or, or perhaps lost some cap capabilities of him to maybe get on top with some of those scrambles. And I think that would have looked much better for the judges, whereas he allowed Umar to kind of get back to his feet and reattack. So uh, while that, that should absolutely be applauded, all the grappling uh, improvements that he's made, I think he he faltered there a little bit. And I also think the the volume or lack thereof in his striking really hurt him in some critical spots because he was finding a lot of success with his left hook, but he just wasn't throwing enough volume to sway the judges his way, I think. And I felt like critically late in the fight, you just needed more, right? And I yeah. know that Umar rendered him defensive at times, but this does end up being like a two-year championship setback. I say it all the time, and I think there's a very deflating nature to this loss. Now, Arnold Allen fought Max Holloway, and there were moments for Arnold in that fight, and he was competitive at times. But I don't know that you left that fight thinking that in a 10-fight series between Arnold Allen and Max Holloway that Max was in any great danger of losing more than one or two of those fights. And I feel like maybe this result's going to be particularly deflating to Corey Sandhagen because he's prepped for him twice, essentially. He seemingly knows how to prepare. It was all hands on deck when it came to the preparation and getting the specific type of bodies. I'm not saying Corey Sanhagen can't get better. Fuck, I'm not saying Tony Ferguson, to his word, can't get better. But I don't know, Kenny. I mean, do you feel like this is a particularly deflating loss for Corey, just given that so much went into this? And I'm not, I don't want to say, like, I keep stopping myself from saying there are levels to this game, but I just think Umar's better. Yeah, I'll say this. I think Corey can absolutely make it right back to the top. I think he can challenge for a championship belt in the near future. However, nothing is guaranteed. Um, you know, do you know how much volatility is about to happen potentially in that division with Marab and Sean O'Malley yeah. fighting in, in the near future? I mean, it's like shit. Marab gets a win and maybe they do a rematch with O'Malley. Right. And then that pushes the Umar fight back, potentially, or Umar gets a shot, beats Marab, and then O'Malley kind of gets back into the picture. What happens with Corey? You have all these other great 135 pounders that are knocking on the door. And I get it. And that's just not talking about, you know, injuries or anything else that happens outside of the sport. It's just this sport is freaking brutal, man. It really, really is. And to lose that close to getting a title shot could do potentially, um, you know, some some damage to your hopes of getting back to the top. However, there's one guy who could do it. It's Corey Sanhagen. From a skills perspective, he's right there, man. He's still absolutely elite. I don't like using that word lightly. He is yeah. one of the best in the world. He can make it up there, but it's going to require a little bit of luck. And that's just kind of the nature of the UFC these days. There's just so many killers and the UFC wants to move forward. They want to promote more and more fights. So uh, it's tricky, man. No, that's perfectly put as usual. And maybe Cody can chase just how long the Sanhagen layoff was when he had that pretty devastating shoulder injury. Sanhagen is elite. And that I think is the buzzword. And that's why we're having this conversation because he's always been on that short list of the best fighters in any division who hasn't fought for the undisputed title. 
Sean O'Malley was able to get through Piotr Jan. Corey Sandhagen was not when he fought him for the interim championship. And now we sit here and wonder if Corey Sandhagen's ever going to fight for the undisputed title. It sounds like Ken Flo would bet some pretty good money that he will get back to that precipice, or I should say get to that position that he has been so close to in the past. Let's not forget, this dude was coming off a win over Marlon Chido Vera. And Cheeto ended up fighting Sean O'Malley for the championship in right. part because he had a head-to-head win over Sean. And there were other reasons why that, as a UFC 299 main event, had tremendous traction. But we sat here and talked to Corey Sanhagen last week and said, you're already title shot worthy. And now, right, with everything that needs to go right, Kenny, to your point, some good fortune, health is wealth, to win yep. that next fight against an elite 35er in a five round setting, potentially in a main event. I don't know who's going to be next for Corey Sandhagen. It's going to be a big fight and uh, he's probably going to be favored to win it. But Umar Nurmagomedov is the story cam flow. And uh, I asked a question on X, Cody, if you could populate the uh, band and weight rankings, that would be fucking fantastic. Poll question for the Anakin Florian podcast this week. Who will be the UFC band and weight champion at this time next year, Kenny? The choices I gave out, Sean O'Malley, Marab Dwalishwili. Of course, those are the men fighting for the title September 14th. Umar Nurmagomedov, and then Piotr Jan or Davison Figueredo. So who will be the Bantamweight champion in August of 2025, Ken Flo? You think it's O'Malley, Dwalishwili, Nurmagomedov, Piotr Jan, Davison Figueredo? Uh, based on what I've just seen, and perhaps there's some recency bias here, I would say Umar Nurmagomedov. Uh, uh, th- I mean, very few people can strike and grapple like him right now in that division, uh, which offers offers him up more options to win. And, um, you know, y- y- you compound that with uh, his ability to execute in some difficult spots, his ability to learn from that last big fight against Sanhagen, the fact that he's got Habib Nurmagomedov in his corner uh, yeah. to guide him through his career. Um, I-, I would not be a bit surprised at all if uh, Nurmagomedov's champ next year, yeah. Bantamweight is just fascinating right now, and I'll get to the poll results themselves in a second. But Sean O'Malley's already helping build this fight potentially with Umar Nurmagomedov. His eyes are firmly focused on Marab Dwalishwili. Sean O'Malley is actually a betting underdog right now, I think plus 136 on DraftKings Sportsbook. And I know that would surprise a lot of the fellow Bantamweights out there near the top, Umar Nurmagomedov potentially among them, you know. But Dude, O'Malley versus Nurmagomedov as a pay-per-view would be monstrous. Mm -hmm. I was doing submission radio or another interview. No, I think it was submission radio, and they were talking about how Sean is drawing comparisons to Khabib versus Connor when it comes to him versus Umar. You know, be a huge fucking fight, Ken Flo, even though there are maybe some parallels within there. It's not necessarily a complete parallel. But uh, yeah, dude, Bantamweight's on fire right now. The poll results, Kenny, dovetail with your answer. 45% of respondents believe that at this time next year, Umar Nurmagomedov will be the Bantamweight champion. 30% say Sean O'Malley, 22% say Marab, and then 3% say Piotr Jan or Davis and Figueredo. You know, if it was a betting ticket, I wouldn't mind having a little ticket on Piotr Jan or Davis and Figueredo because those guys on any given Saturday night are fantastic. Uh, Kenny, anything else on Umar? I mean, I don't know who's going to be next for Corey Sandhagen, right? I mean, Cejudo is there in the top five. A rematch with Cheeto. I don't know that that makes a ton of sense, but Marlon's number four, Piotr Jan three. Um, anything else, Ken Flo? I mean, there's nothing for me to exhaust on Umar. He's going to be next for a championship. Um, who do you think, Sanhagen? Maybe Dominic Cruz? Cruz, think, what do you think, Dom? Oh, dude, that would be a great fight. I didn't think about that. The one against Dominic Cruz, I really like. That might be even more probable than the uh, answer I was going to give you here, which I, I think would be Davis and Figueredo. You know, I, I think that's interesting. Yeah. I know he he wants to fight probably Piotr Jan, and I love that fight as well. Um, but uh, who knows? Uh, it's tough because Davison won. Corey did not. So maybe Davison yeah. just kind of wants to move on to somebody else. Uh, right. So. So, some interesting options. Again, that division is absolute fire. I think San Hagen Cruz makes a lot of sense. I know I like that it. fight had been bandied about in the past, and I think just given that San Hagen is off a loss, maybe you stack those guys on a uh, on a pay per view, and uh, and San Hagen gets an opportunity to uh, you know work his way back. Why don't we skip Charles Bullet for a minute and get into Davis and Figueroa if we could? Deus de Geha, God of War. Cody's buying merchandise in another window right now. <laughs> he gets it done over Marlon Chido Vera by unanimous decision. And uh, look at this guy, man, at 135 pounds. I think he's he's really a guy who who could contend. And, uh, you know, if it weren't for this little potential log jam, you know, he might already have a title shot in a second division. What were your thoughts on Davison 
I thought making really uh, smart work of uh, of Cheeto Vera over the weekend. Smart work is exactly what he did there. I think, you know, two things, really. And, and this has kind of been the kryptonite of Cheeto Vera. Uh, first of all, takedowns, right? But even more important than that is footwork or a lack thereof. I, I think that he's always been a little bit too flat-footed. And if you're going to come and get it, then Cheeto's going to give it to you. That's fine. But if you want to get in and get out, Cheeto is going to struggle in that fight. It's just it has always happened, unfortunately, for him. Um, his individual weapons, you know, his knees, his kicks, his elbows, his ability to clinch, like that's all great. Um, it, it's very, very good. But what what he's really lacking and what he needs to really kind of maybe just take six months off and work on this exclusively is his footwork. He needs to put himself in the proper position to strike and not get hit. And for a guy with that kind of range, that's what he needs to do. And for Figueredo, you know, him being a little bit the smaller guy, um, it, he has a lot of power. We know that he when he hits you, he hurts you. Um, and I think it probably came down to round three. Because he dropped Cheeto Vera at that specific time, I believe that's what won him the fight. Yeah. Right. That was the thing that, you know, everybody's going to remember. And, you know, um, his ability to get in and get out, his ability to kind of faint and hit those takedowns at crucial spots is what won him the round. So for me, you know, if you look back at some of Davison's earlier fights, um, he was kind of his own worst enemy. He'd get a little too ramped up, he'd get a little too excited, and he'd do something dumb, uh, if I'm being candid. Now, we're not seeing that. I, I think he's fighting like a veteran now. He's fighting really, really smart. And to see that change up uh, at a, in a difficult fight against Cheeto Vera shows that Davison is getting better, and he's definitely someone you got to watch out for in that division. So Marlon Cheeto Vera is trying to change some things up, right? And perhaps you're suggesting maybe more of a reset button completely and taking six months off, right? We heard him talk about less marathon run running and, and more sprinting. But when I was talking about Corey Sanhagen, I, I'm not suggesting that he has hit the ceiling right now. But I think for Marlon Cheeto Vera, maybe a victim of his own success at times, right? Mm -hmm. As this division's most decorated finisher, like for Jason Perillo, right? Having to sort of navigate a guy mid-career without all of this developmental time, right? Doesn't footwork take like a ton of time? It does. It really does. And I, and I think Jason is a tremendous um, a coach, I think, but like, and, and I don't want to just, you know, paint all of his fighters this way, but I, I think that that's kind of been something that, perhaps is lacking um maybe not in a boxing contest but uh, in a context but more in an mma context um because i think that's where some of his fighters have suffered you know um they're a little flat-footed and it's great because he teaches them to really create power off the floor get nice and low in your stance however i don't know how conducive it is in a mixed martial arts context when you're talking about calf kicks you know uh, uh different types of leg kicks you know body shots getting in getting out takedowns all those things um are much different than say boxing footwork and, and yeah you know that's my analysis from looking from the outside in and, and that may or may not be the case that's just what i've seen i see a pattern there right and um i, I think if cheeto can take that time because he is a good athlete to work on those things you know okay yes conditioning is a big part of your um you know game plan However, why don't you use that conditioning to really be able to be light on your feet and right. move in and move right. out? Because at 135 pounds, those guys can move fast, they can hit hard, and that's where he's kind of struggled in the past if he's if he's paying attention and looking yeah. at the, some past fights. Because this is another guy with a ton of potential. I love Cheeto. I love the way he right. fights. He's a great fighter. He's committed to the game. That's the, the, the one thing, the one vulnerability I see in his game right now. And he has reached out to you and solicited your analysis in the past. And you guys, I know, go back a long way. He's still in his young 30s. There's still, I think, some real opportunity for Cheeto, just given a lot of his God-given ability, his just clear intentions, just the way his mind works in terms of yeah. his commitment to the cause. So I do still believe in Cheeto. On the other side, though, for Davis and Figueredo, Ken Flo, I mean, is this a guy you think can contend with the likes of Piotr Jan, Marab Dwalish, Willie, Sean O'Malley, and everybody else. I'm not sure if he can quite break through in that weight class in the top four or five. And, and it's not because Davison isn't a good fighter. It's just those top 
four or five are really freaking good, man. Those guys are just killers. And I, I think that he can cause some trouble. And again, anytime you have one punch, one punch knockout power, something I never really had, um, it, it's it you it gives yourself a, a much better chance, right? I mean, one punch can change it. I think Davison does have that one punch uh, fight changing power. However, I think some of those guys do as well. And uh, when you're talking about elite wrestling, the Marabs, you know, the Umar Nurmagomedovs, and elite strikers like Sean O'Malley, like. I don't know if he can even touch Sean O'Malley. You know, I I don't know. It's going to be tough. So, yeah. Oh, do you know who you're picking? Ken Flo, O'Malley, Dwalish Willie. Yep. Ken Flo knows. (laughs) Ken Flo knows. Hopefully Ray Longo's not in the back right now. I actually feel, uh, I'm not even going to say that on a hot microphone. I'm just sort of looking at the top 15 right now as we spin things forward for Davis and Figueredo. Yeah, not out of the realm of possibility. He could find himself in a main event against somebody like Corey Sanhagen. Could always do Davis and Figueredo versus Dominic Cruz. And see, that's the thing. Mm. Even though Cruz, he's coming off a loss, and even though he's ranked number 13 in the world, as Dominic tries to get his body ready to compete, he's a big fight and maybe the biggest fight for a lot of these guys. And a lot of them maybe think it's even a more winnable fight than it is because of Dominic's age, you know, and yeah. uh, where he is relative to the prime of his career, at least as far as the public perception is concerned. So we'll see what happens, but I love Davis and Figueredo as a fighter and uh, nice to see him realizing success in a second division. So Shara bullet Magomedov over Mikhail Oleg in what was the fight of the night in the co-main event, Ken Flo and any credit that maybe I was reluctant to give Shara bullet after the win over Antonio Trocoli in Saudi Arabia. I certainly would give him here, I think any UFC fighter deserves credit for turning around quickly, right? After yeah. fighting a f- hard 15 minutes, regardless of what the circumstances were for his opponent back in Saudi Arabia, this was an outstanding performance. What a great striker. And even though there are a lot of wrestlers and grapplers that in theory await in this division, in terms of maximizing the showcase with this particular opponent and you know beating him up with, uh, with every part of his body, I thought Shara Bullet looked great. I thought this was his best performance so far in the UFC, especially given the fact that Oleg Seychuk is a very good and dangerous oh, yeah. striker himself. And, you know, th- this was this was a dangerous fight. But I think, you know, talk about forework. I think this really was the difference. His ability to move, his ability to move laterally, his ability to avoid a lot of the power strikes of Oleg Seychuk and counter properly. You know, um, the uniqueness of his striking, the variety of his striking really are the things that stood out to me. I thought this was a very good performance. I thought it was a really fun fight. Oleg Sechuk was really doing his best uh, to try to knock Shara out. Uh, It was not to be. Um, And especially given the fact that this was a really quick turnaround, your body is tired. Your body is tired after a lot of these long camps and this was back to back fights. And for Shara, I think this is going to be a big confidence builder for him. I like this fight from a stylistic standpoint as well for him to build his experience in the UFC's octagon. Um, so I think this is something he can be proud of, build off of and, and get some bigger fights. So that, yeah, that, that was there's cool. really nothing to add. I think it's a great win upon which to build and uh, another bonus for him. So I think $100,000 in uh Post-fight bonuses over the stretch of six weeks or so. Uh, what do you have for us on Mackenzie Dern over Lupe Godinez? Close fight. It goes to Dern by unanimous decision. Well, I, I think Godinez, um, you know, kind of screwed up in round one, allowing for that takedown, which was a beautiful Oso Tagari, that outside reaping trip there from Mackenzie Dern, uh, landed her right in mount and just stole that round completely, in my opinion, from Godinez. So that was critical. But you got to credit Dern and, and Perillo here uh, for, I guess, just making Mackenzie look that much more comfortable on the feet, man. She was aggressive. She was comfortable from a technical standpoint. She was keeping her balance on a lot of those strikes, whereas before she would throw strikes, but kind of be off balance, kind of be off rhythm, wouldn't be breathing properly. She looked Awesome. I mean, physically on the scale, she looked great. She came in extremely fit. She was saying the right things, how she wants to be a champion in this division. So you love to hear that. Um, She's so potent on the ground. She's so damn good on the ground. Um, But she really has been putting the work in her striking now. So everything from her stance, her balance looked really good there. She hit a gorgeous takedown, like I said, in round one. I want to see more integration of her strikes into takedowns. 
Um, there were some uh, very good clinches just on the technical side of things, just improving things with yeah. her technical wrestling will go a long way now if she can kind of put in that work and that and get that going. You know, uh, she could flip the script completely, man. Yeah, she dude. really could uh, fight for the belt. So she is that good on the ground. And to see her improvement shows that she's committed. And, and that's a really good sign for her and her team. I share your enthusiasm. I think she has buckets of appetite for improvement, right? She's obviously putting in the work. And I think there have been sort of peaks and valleys to her UFC career. This was a woman who was crying during training for her UFC debut against Ashley Yoder during sparring. And I'm taking notes as you're talking just in terms of her relative comfortability now inside the octagon and with everything that fight week entails, like this kind of felt like the week during which Mackenzie Dern like turned a real corner. Like she is a fighter. Like she is a mixed martial arts athlete. I think she could be world champion, which isn't something that should be turned into a headline because you can be sure if she's fighting Zhang Wei Li or anybody else, Kenny, you end up in a grappling situation with this woman. She can find a fucking submission, you know? So I'm really excited. This is a, a hard woman to beat. Lupi Godinez is a yeah. hard woman to beat. This is a, a big win for Mackenzie Dern. And uh, yeah, I just think that everything that you and I are seeing when it comes to and hearing in the lead up to these fights uh, is very encouraging when it comes to uh, to Mackenzie Dern at 115 pounds. Um, Joel Alvarez, a big bonus winner, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, over Elvis Brenner, Michael Chiesa, obviously over Tony Ferguson. Uh, anything else on the main car? We're going to talk to Chiesa later. We could do some Ferguson stuff now. I did want to get to it with... Uh, with Ray Longo. Did you see the Joel Alvarez fight, Ken Flo? I did, dude. This kid's good, man. Yeah. He's good. He's really good. The improvements he's made with his striking, uh, it, it's significant or are significant. Um, and he just looked good, man. Just a lot cleaner. Uh, I, I think that um, Elvis Brenner just looked a little bit um, off balance with some of the stuff he was doing. He's aggressive um, and he was really going for it. But Alvarez was just a little bit too technical, a little bit too long. Landing really good strikes. The kid's a killer, man. Um, he go he gonna be a problem. Yeah, yeah. All right. So Tony Ferguson had twelve straight wins and now eight straight losses. And we're gonna get to Ray Longo, not now, but right now. But I do need Joe Romero, our resident Anakin Florian podcast artist, to make me a T-shirt with Tony Ferguson's twelve fight winning streak on it because that is now a thing of the past uh, never the past the future oh the fucking God. present ray longo made it every week on the anakin florian Jeez, podcast Raymond, man. how we doing okay that's the way to wake me up but we feeling better than last week john that's all i want to know right off the bat yeah we're feeling a lot better all i don't right. know what that's i what need I'm to do about, to baby. ensure that my wi-fi will get through i have three <laughs> different wi-fi providers i pay now 270 dollars a month i pay xfinity I pay AT and T and another provider that shall not be named, Dang. just to try to have everything be buttoned up. And of course, last week it failed me. But Raymond, you just yeah. wake it up. It's eleven forty four a.m. Eastern Standard well, Time. I'm, I'm, I'm rarer than go, buddy. I've been up. I've been up. All 10 right, minutes. Twitch. Let's go. Well, yeah. twitchy today, Raymond. What? <laughs> uh, when are you leaving for Las Vegas, Ray? Uh, leaving Wednesday. All right. So. We have an exercise off the top today. And if you don't know, one of Ray's prized pupils is competing in the featured preliminary bout this weekend at that little UFC apex in that tiny regional octagon that they tried out there. So how do you pronounce your athlete's name, Ray? Haralampos Gregorio. All right. So we actually have Haralampos saying his own name for Let's you today, it. just so you can try to uh, perfect it as the week as the week goes on. That's Canada. Haralampos de Ferocious Gregorio. One more time. Haralampos de Ferocious Gregorio. Well, I left out the Ferocious. I do. But I got the Haralampos de Ferocious Gregorio. How's that? Amazing. Kenny, uh, the way he says his surname, I mean, he almost adds some other. Yeah, is, it, is it Gregorio? Is it We're going to hear, don't do We're going to hear him say it again. Yeah. Yeah. It's because I'm married to a Cuban and it got roll the eyes, <laughs> my man. Yes. Look at that. So your daughters are Cuban American. Haralampos. Haralampos. Gregorio. Haralampos. Haralampos. Gregorio. 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 This is one of those fights you voice and then you get a call from one of the producers. It's like, hey, man, how are you pronouncing Haralampos Gregorio? 
It's like, how you pronouncing it, man? I'll retrack it, all right? So, Ray, this is pretty exciting. Pretty big fight for your guy. He's favored yes. to beat uh, Toshiomi Kazama. Kenflo's going to make a prediction on that fight later today. He's been researching all night. So, yeah. What, is that all you Give got? Give me some yet? info, Ray. Jesus what do I oh, no. oh, oh, you want info? Come no, on. Great What's his camp. Style? Great camp. Guys going forward. Great power in his hands. Well rounded. He's getting the job done. All right. So, Kenny, if this was one of my guys who was fighting, right? I mean, I would be getting pretty hyperbolic, okay? So, <laughs> Haralampo started fighting professionally because his father wanted him to stop fighting on the streets. I mean, what, what kind of guys are you bringing in there, Sarah Longo, fight team, Ray? Uh, street I, fighters. I don't believe that. He's a nice kid. I, I can't see him even getting into a street fight. But maybe Greece is different than over here. But Cyprus. That's straight off Cyprus, his fucking yeah. fighter bio, bro. You really? think I'm making that up? He's a really nice kid. What are you laughing at, Cam Flo? It's <laughs> off the fighter bio. I mean, I got better things to do than, you know, prep fight oh, night prelims man. that I'm not calling. That's straight off his bio. His dad wanted him to stop picking fights on the streets. He's probably fucking beating ass on the streets, Ray. Yeah, like, I let's guess. get this kid under control. And it sounds like that's not the human being that you encounter every day there in Def Dark City, New York. De definitely not. Uh, Super nice guy. Um, is he a nurse? He was, yeah. Okay, good. I mean, I don't know the extent to which you do a deep dive on these athletes. Yes, male <laughs> nurse, right? Yes. All right, next up. Uh, he fought C-Rod in 2021. Have you ingested that film? Were you in the corner when he fought Christian Rodriguez in 2021? Oh, yeah. It wasn't a good night. Kenny, what am I doing wrong, man? <laughs> what I, yeah, oh, yeah. No, no, Kenny, it wasn't a good – of course I was there. That was a – that wasn't a, it wasn't a good night. Like, what do you oh, oh yeah. Uh -huh. I like to uh yeah. I'd like to forget yeah. that. I'd like to forget that night, but sure. Chris, I'm a big fan of Christian Rodriguez. I think he's great. <laughs> but uh Pompos didn't have a good night that night. Okay. We're gonna right. rectify everything this Saturday <laughs> night, trust me. Are you gonna be there, Ray? Are you cornering be, this guy? I will be there. I will be there. All I'm right. expecting to see Big Ron. I got some clothes for him. I've been promising. Good. What size? So, nice. Double XL, baby. He's, he's a triple X. Right. right He's fitting into these. These are big. Yeah, all right. Yeah, he'll He's, try. Uh, it's the thought that counts anyway, but thanks. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, I was at the Paradise Cantina Superstore the other day. Our executive producer, Cody Marrow, suggested that uh, they had a store. And uh, I went and bought myself a Cantina t-shirt wow. just to show my support, you know. so I'll be, I'm yeah. going to do the same. Love, yeah. love Big Ron. Yeah. This clo Maybe these we clothes are coming right out of road. What was that? Maybe we could get a promo code for you from Big Ron when you're out there. Maybe you could just oh, yeah. buy it right in front of his face. Yeah. You know? that's, that's it. I think you guys got better uses of your time, but that's exciting <laughs> that you guys are going to connect. And uh, hopefully you come back with a win next week. 100%. All right. Umar Nurmagomedov. Oof. Oh, man. I mean, this got to be like a three to one favorite to beat your guy, Marab, if they fought, huh? Jesus Christ. He's, he's a problem. No. <laughs> hey, what'd you think of Umar, though? Marab or out, out wrestle him. Uh, He's, his kid's good. Listen, first off, I think it was 100% the scoring is right, but it was a close fight. It was a very technical yeah. fight. Uh, it was it was uh, Corey's fight to win or lose, I think. I mean, he just, I think he did a fantastic job on the wrestling defense, like A++, plus plus, did mm -hmm. a great job shutting it down. But I think he got too obsessed with that and maybe forgot about what he was doing standing up. I mean, Kenny, he would hit him with the left hook, but no follow-ups. It was one punch, and then Umar would come back with three. You're never going to win those exchanges. I mean, he had a – the corner advice was perfect, and those are the frustrating times for a corner because he was told the right thing to do it. Make it a dirty fight. You got to step in the pocket and throw with this kid. They mm -hmm. told him, look, you got the wrestling down. He's not – there's no damage on the floor. You know, by the time when they were telling him that. So I think it was his fight to win or lose. And for whatever reason, he couldn't pull the trigger in the pocket. And he was landing just not enough. You know what I mean? Like, again, he landed that left hook four times. Not one time did I see a combination come out of him. It was actually kind of hard to watch because he was right there. Very technical. Right there. Close, right? right there. Right there. I said so, the exact same thing, Ray. Yeah. I don't, yeah. So. It's know. hard though, right? And I don't even love yes. having these conversations, especially with a guy like Ken Flo, right? Who was in a lot of these big spots, right? And you guys both are suggesting that, you know, in this massive spot with a title fight on the line that San Hagen just couldn't pull the trigger for whatever reason, you know? And it's just, I don't know, man. Like, I just, I just wonder what this ingestion of this fight is going to be like for Corey 
after the fact because yes we can laud his defense but um that's not that doesn't win fights like well, I mean, that doesn't only, score yeah only he can tell us john but i think the observation that we're making is that we believe he could have won the fight exactly just by, yeah. you know right and, and i think he got the the right advice from his corner i mean even the, the wrestling guy said to him he goes you're doing great with the wrestling defense you you got i think and even trevor said make it ugly and right. making it ugly is step in the pocket and throw your fucking combinations. Well, right, I mean, right. You were landing. You were landing, but one punch at a time isn't going to do it. So I think, I you know, look, I could surmise that he spent so much time on the takedown defense that maybe he was lax with what he's good at. But Corey's fought the best in the world. He's got great experience. Uh, Umar did a great job. I mean, he's a, definitely a tough kid, formidable. 100 percent won the fight but it was a close technical fight yeah yes uh, I, I really thought he won the first two rounds but i know i'm alone with that but no uh, not necessarily he, alone with that you know even his corner was saying you're down two when they were going into the you know when they're going into the fourth i think which i go wow that's it was those rounds were tight man so bottom line and again i'm a fan i'm not an expert but when kenny fought jose aldo in 2011 and i'm not trying to be funny right and yeah maybe we were stoned and drunk whatever but kenny was up 2-1 and we were all crying in our cheerios after the fact just thinking that in round five you know and kenny was on no legs right but we're sitting there watching his fans thinking like if kenny just throws caution to the fucking wind yeah maybe he ends up twitching on the canvas but we felt like he was going to beat Jose Aldo and yeah, he won yeah. the first two rounds too. You know what I mean? It's a really tough thing. Sometimes no. the opponent just does enough and it's like every time you're trying to get off, you know, and then all of a sudden 300 seconds, fifth and final round, they expire. Yeah, no, you're right, John. But you know, I think it's, it comes a point. He's never been finished. You got to believe in your chin and this is the time to do it. If you have to go out on your shield, this is the fight. You're not going to get another chance after this. I mean, he's been in some, some really great fights and i think that experience i w w we're complimenting them we're not we're not taking anything away from it we're just trying to you figure guys are. out yeah we are i think we are you know um but yeah you know it was it was kind of when a guy's not responding to his corner it's 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 kind of for me it's kind of frustrating because it's happened to me and yeah you really want the best for your athlete and you're really trying to motivate them and for whatever reason uh it's not getting across and yeah. that's you know that that that's what i was feeling watching the fight yeah i'm curious for you ray watching this fight as a guy who's about to coach the number one contender fighting for the world championship and knowing not just that their nirmago medov surname rings true but also that umar is a, a different athlete than habib but also yeah. a guy that people are anointing right now, right? Like we do a poll, people think this guy's gonna be the champion at this time next year. Mm -hmm. He's already been guaranteed a title fight by Dana White, you know? He is probably gonna be the betting favorite uh, against Sean or your guy. I'm just curious how you sort of uh, are watching this fight with any of those things or none of those things in mind. Well, I was watching it with, definitely with a lot of things in mind, but right now the focus is on Sean O'Malley, so. Uh, I like what Cody did in the wrestling, and that gives me a real good gauge on what I think Marab would do because mm. I think his, you know, he's he's going to, it looks like he's, I mean, it just, it gave me a lot of hope on a lot of things, you know, so. Yeah. No, that's, that's interesting. That's good. No, that's about it. But, you know, but right now it's about O'Malley's who's, you know, who's a four, you know, another guy who's, all three of those guys I think would match up fantastic. And you meant Corey, not Cody, because Cody, Corey. Cody, I've seen Cody wrestle. He's our producer. His wrestling's terrible. I mean, right. he's, Cody's he's wrestling. He can, strike, not, he's he can strike, though. He's yeah. got the length. He's got a good jab. Keeps you on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse so, me. I, I meant Corey. Ray, we're yeah. going to spend so much of the Ray Longo minute over the next five to six weeks talking about Sean O'Malley and Marab Dwalishwili that I'm sort of reluctant to do so now but i think in the context of umar's emergence over the weekend and everything that's going on in the division it makes a lot of sense you're like minus 165 to beat this sean o'malley right now and i know this is but wow. one lens through which to look at the fight but johnny avello is my friend he sets the line at the DraftKings sportsbook and obviously it's commanding two-way action to some degree because the price really isn't moving you know I don't know if it speaks to uh, Marab's style, his winning streak, or what, but for you guys to be favored against 
a champion like this. Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty impressive. I don't know where it'll close, but, uh, you know, don't fuck it up. You guys are favored to get the job done <laughs> September 14th. Yeah. Listen, I think Marab's been waiting for this. I think you're going to have to kill him in there to yeah. stop him to get what he wants. I think that's what people are feeling. By no means would anybody take O'Malley for granted. I don't care what the odds are. So that's not going to happen. But Marab is Marab. He's going to do what Marab does. And if O'Malley really can't start him, he's in for a really, really long night. Marab down to minus 148, Sean O'Malley, plus 124 <laughs> for the That's live good. number is right now. Is that based on what we're saying? Right yeah, I mean, that is just moving. We are moving the, the line. We got live odds now based on the podcast. No, Marab's <laughs> a hard guy to stop. Um, I, like, I like the fight for him. Yeah. All right. A few other things I'd like to get to. I think my son and my dog are fighting downstairs. By the way, all fathers of daughters in this uh, in this room here, except for our executive producer, Cody Merrow, who is still undecided as to whether or not he wants to, you know, spread his seed and procreate. Um, my eldest child is 13 today. Wow. So I got a teenager. Congrats. Wow. Yeah. I That's mean, I'll be, I'm, I'm one of those guys who can't wait to be an empty nester, you know. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Please oh, go out of state so you can't I, drive home. That is, that is really true, though. That's for more for the women, I think they talk about, not the right. men. Yeah. You know. Right. Empty yeah. nest is probably the wrong way to put it, right? It's <laughs> like, get my oh. fucking house back, you know? The nest <laughs> reincarnate. If I can reincarnate this nest, you know, my son downstairs, by the way, here's this. See, Kenny and I, yeah, I mean, my son here and all of this, like, what do you think he thinks of his dad right now, you know? Like, think yeah, my think, dad's a lunatic, right? No, he yeah. thinks you're a superhero. That's what he thinks. Oh, I don't know. A hundred percent. Yeah, hope so. Yeah. Hope so. All right. So a few other things, if we could, before we get John out of here. And thanks for popping on 15 minutes later today, Raymond. What does your Monday hold? You heading to the gym as soon as we're done here? As soon as I'm done. Running out right. the door. All right. Well, then we'll only keep you nine minutes instead of 15. All yeah. right. So Michael Chiesa over Tony Ferguson by Rear Naked Choke, 344 of round one. So we're going to talk to Michael Chiesa here in about a half an hour, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on the Tony Ferguson side of things, right? This is a 40 year old man who was the first in UFC history to put a double digit winning streak on paper at 155 pounds and goes from 12 straight wins to eight straight losses. Not like that, but sort of feels like that. So what were your thoughts on Tony and what do you think about his fighting future? Man, I think, um, I don't know. I, I hate to see that, you know, because the guy was so dominant at one point and to see him on an eight fight losing streak and you know that he wouldn't have lost those fights, you know, when he was on his coming up thing. But, you know, well, first of all, hats off to Michael Kies. I absolutely love him, consider him a, a friend and great job by him. But, uh, you know, John, the other side of it is, you know, he's got a family. And if he can go in there and I'm sure they're paying him good money and he gets tapped out like that, he's not hurt. <clears throat> right. Who are we to take that away from him? Right. I mean, I think it happens every day in every line of uh, every line of work. So, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. on that on that end, you know, if you could if you could deal with the uh, internal problems and, you know, kind of just yeah. destroying your legacy, you know, for money, then <clears throat> that's right. his, that's his decision to make. Yeah, Kenny, like that's why I need his winning streak on a T-shirt like pronto, right? Because I don't want this legacy to be right. diminished before we can actually put the guy in the Hall of Fame, right? I don't want it to be nine or ten successive losses. And then it's like, man, you know, how do you put him in the Hall of Fame? Because people don't even remember that part of the history, right? Like, yeah, I mean, Joe Lozon, Kenny, can knock a motherfucker out, right? Like he's still under contract, hasn't had a fight in years for whatever reason, right? Like. Are we trying to get Tony like grapplers like Kiesa and Lozon to protect him? I, I, even though he utters that he can get better, like, yes, maybe in one realm of martial arts, but I don't feel like Tony Ferguson is going to present a better version the next time out. I, I don't know what you do promotionally other than, uh, you know, put him in the Hall of Fame. Well, especially at 170 pounds, where now you're getting into that territory where guys can hit you with a shot that can render you. I mean, not only unconscious, but you, you could be a different guy when you wake up. I mean, it's that kind of power. And, uh, you know, Tony has had his fair share of wars. Um, I, I think probably the big struggle for him is financially, what is he to do now? 
um, and even more so than, you know, who am I? Uh, because he's been a fighter for so long. That is the toughest decision to make yeah. because in doing that, you say goodbye to yourself or mm -hmm. at least a, a large part of yourself. Yeah, Tony Ferguson is no longer a fighter. What does that look yeah. like? And right. that's the scary part. And that's where, you know, making certain financial decisions are extremely important. Um, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if, if he if he's no longer with the UFC, I, I'm not sure that Tony is just going to kind of go away quietly. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some other offer comes on the table. Sure. You know, and then it's too good to pass up. And then he's got to take that last fight. So. I don't know, man. He's done, he's done amazing things in this sport, uh, but unfortunately, John, and, and I love that you're bringing up that 12-fight win streak, which is insane. Um, however, people remember you for what you did most recently, for better or worse. And, yeah, and I oh, think that, that's doubt. what people, especially how, how many new fans have come oh. into the sport since 2020. They don't know. They never saw uh, Tony Ferguson in his prime. They don't without even know what doubt. that means. Yeah, it's it's sad. I, I agree 100 percent with you, man. I mean, I think the fan base kind of turns over every couple of years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's a, it, like I remember years ago, I forget. I think I was going to Australia, but I had a guy and he, he after like Chuck Liddell was done. He, that was it. He never watched it again. They, the fans keep turning right. over. And then I, I have like my a good friend of mine said, man, I can't believe my nephews are into it now. But they weren't into it five years ago. It's just. Right. They don't know who Tony Ferguson is. They, right. and they don't, and unfortunately, they don't right. care either. You right. know, so that's a that's 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 the tough conversation for him, man. Yeah, he's the boogeyman, right? He's yeah. fucking El Kukui. He's the guy who, in his prime, a lot of us felt like would give Khabib Nurmagomedov his toughest fight. He was scheduled to fight Khabib in five different calendar years. Yeah, it's just right. insane. It really is. So uh, print the shirts. We congratulate Tony Ferguson on his career if indeed this is uh, the end. And I do think the only way to sort of steer the direction as far as he's concerned is to try to put him in the UFC Hall of Fame. But I don't think you're going to prevent him from competing in a bare knuckle setting or one of these other settings that could provide some real danger um, because he's got a fan base and, uh, you know, he still has that appetite for competition that I'm not sure is ever going to go away. Speaking of which, Ray, we're going to let you go. Oh, go ahead. So. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, I think. Honestly, I hate to say it. I think uh, the damage is kind of already done. <clears throat> so he's got to really be careful. Yeah. You know, his reflexes aren't the same. Nothing's the same. Yeah. You know, yeah. you could see it. It's, uh, yeah. And then when you start talking about, I could get better at 40. Yeah. Man, that's, that, that's hard. That's just yeah. hard to listen yeah. to. You know, you, you know, whatever. All right. Give me 60 more seconds. Yeah, Kenny no, was no. talking earlier about footwork and how yeah. Marlon Chido Vera maybe should push the reset button and spend six to eight months just focusing solely on that. When you're trying to affect wholesale change or major change when it comes to a striker, right? And this is not just one discipline like boxing. How do you how do you go about doing that? Because clearly for Marlon Vera, something's going to have to be done if he's going to compete against the elite. Yeah, first off, hats off to Del Delson. Is that his name? Davison. 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 Yep. Fantastic performance by him yeah. against a tough guy <clears throat> coming up in weight. Uh, look, to, for to your question, uh, first off, Cheeto has to be receptive to that. That's the first thing. If he's receptive to it, you, you could make the change. I mean, we have a kid in the gym now. I think he's really going to be good. His name is Levon. And I I'm not going to pronounce his last name, but another Georgian guy. He's got that European footwork, man, where he's bouncing. He's got the long lead. He's like 6'1 for a 55 and maybe taller. Wow. He's in and out. So he's been working with guys in the gym. And, you know, the guys that want to try something new, you know, it's technically not my style, you know, but he 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 pulls it off. Unbelievable. The kid is might be the one of the best strikers I've ever seen. Wow. Uh, without a doubt. No question about it. He's that and he's twenty four. So he's and he he knows how to break it down. I watch him, you know, help people out and stuff. So it's there if you want it. If Cheeto really needs it, you know, uh, he he's going to have to explore. I think some different things. I think you know, Jason comes from a very traditional boxing background, um, and whatever style he was taught, I'm sure that's what he's passing on. But. The footwork thing, you know, if he's receptive to it, they got to. I think he could change if that's what yeah. you're asking. Yeah. 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 Because he's got the no, balls. He's answer. tough as shit, man. Oh, yeah. Know? It's a great answer. 
All right, my man. Well, uh, thanks for carrying all the weight last week. And it uh, looks like oh, we're yeah. back to firing in the studio, but it's great to see you. And uh, hey, wait. what's up? Did we get good reviews last week? Me and Kenny, we were on fire last week. You guys week. were on fire. You don't Big need Ron me. Yeah, pops I was, in. Uh, it's like the old hey, soupy sales show. So guys are showing up at the door. <laughs> dude, I was not available to do a watch party this weekend. I gave Ron the keys to the car. I said, if you want to corral Raymond and Ken Flo, you guys could do a fucking watch party, no, you know? So you guys don't need me. Believe you no, me. No, this no, is, no, no. Hey, that, no wasn't, well, that wasn't the point, though. No, I'm I know. Just we no, have, I know. Uh, I know. But, uh, Prop to Jason do. Anik for stepping on the gas yeah. to get you there real quick. Getting right. Equipment, 100%. Yeah. Right. The fact we do is have, we got it done. That's the bottom we line. We do have an exit strategy, though. It involves Jason Anik. Have you not noticed? I'm trying to make him the host of this program. Like, that's really what I've been doing. Um, um, Wait, I just saw something that Cody wrote too. Let me give a shout out to Al Jermaine Sterling, Funk Harbor. Um, oh, his rum? I'll tell you, it's really yeah, good. Yeah, Cody wanted me to ask you about Al Joe's rum. I made the decision not to, but since you brought it up, yes, Funk Harbor <laughs> is his rum. Uh, Funk Do you, Harbor, uh, have you tried it? I have tried it. And then, uh, you know, I was a rum drinker when I was young, haven't had rum in a long time. Right. <clears throat> but yeah. The rum was fantastic. Really good. Right. Smooth. The doctors of men our age tell tell us to drink like the clear liquors, right? As opposed to maybe the brown ones that are super sweet. But Funk Harbor is fucking great. What about a, a, an alcohol for you? Have you, you have to have been pitched at some point in time? No, I'd, no? I'd, uh, I'd be more of a coffee guy, like a cold. Oh, you like yeah. those espresso martinis, right? Oh, love an no? espresso martini. Oh, love, man. Well, I'll go liquor. I like oh, it. Oh, Longo's lychee fucking liquor, yeah. right? <laughs> oh, you get Longo's espresso martini, dude. He's in here every other night. I can't believe you missed him. Ray? I tell you, we love John, you. are you coming back at me for something? Did I do? <laughs> Was it was it me and Kenny holding down the fort? Was no, that what I did it? No. You sure? No. 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 Okay. I'm trying to my money. Oh, we're just, we're now, just trying just to do. We're concept. just trying to do our job. That's all. Right. <laughs> I, that's what it is. I mean, you know, we're <laughs> just all Bill Belichick train. We're just trying to do our jobs. Uh, well, all right, hey, guys. hopefully you get an espresso martini tonight after uh, <laughs> what figures to be a long day in the gym, fucking holding pads and everything else. Get it in, Raymond. Push the sled <laughs> on that new hip, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Oh, Thank hey, you. Sunday, we're doing a show Sunday. Can you do Sunday, August 11th? Are you around? I'll be flying back if, unless it's at oh, night. Oh, all right. Um, we'll try to figure uh, it out because I'm going to go to Perth on Monday, oh, August wow. 12th. So we're trying to figure it all out. But we'll, uh, if you can we can take that conversation off the air. All right, cool. All right. Ray, hey, still travels, man. Good luck. Let's go. Pompos. Let's go, baby. Hey, good luck, buddy. Bring it home. Thanks. Bring man. it home. Haralambos Take it easy. Take it easy. Same page, Cody. Nicely Don't done there. Para Lampos Gregoriu versus Toshiomi I, Kazama. I almost feel like that G is silent. I don't know what the hell is going on. Okay. No, there is something there. I was actually trying to talk yeah. you into that earlier. Yeah. Um, what was your reaction, incidentally, when you uh, when you saw what was going to be required of you for these UFC Fight Night Tabora versus Spivak 2 predictions? Were you wondering what I was doing producing this show, making you pick a featured prelim? On this fight card, <laughs> I was like, "Oh, Annex going deep," or you're giving me a favor because I'm I'm down on the numbers and you're trying to kick up my numbers a little bit, give me opportunities. Is that what you're doing, John? No, I mean because oh. the picks honestly have nothing to do with the math. You know, if I were you though, I would do a thousand bucks straight on one of these guys this weekend and try right. to uh, affect some real change. Yeah, fight card's pretty lean, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which isn't always the case with some of these fight nights, but we're still going to uh, preview and predict the heck out of it. Let us go three wide now and welcome on Big Gun Brian Petrie for our main event challenge to UFC Fight Night Tabor hey. versus Spivak 2. What's up, Brian? What's up? What's up, boys? Oh, look at his shirt. Look yeah, at the fucking shirt. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Didn't want to wear it last week. Yeah. Didn't want to rub it great. in the haters' face last week, but right. I had it I had it ready to go today. So happy birthday, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate happy it. Happy birthday. Thank you, boys. Appreciate it. So your, your birthday was yesterday? It was. Your daughter's birthday is today. Happy birthday to your daughter. You got a teenager. Thank you, buddy. I saw that. Scary so, stuff, huh? I love what your wife wrote, uh, this big hunk of man yeah. or whatever she wrote. Sure. How old are you, Brian? 38. 38. 38. I mean, look at he this He looks guy. 22. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. It is right out of college. Unbelievable. Eight years old. Yes, sir. <clears throat> 1986. I, I know we go over this annually mm -hmm. around your birthday, but my goodness, Brian, you're aging gracefully. Yeah. Is that, do you have uh, parents and, and grandparents that look young as well? Or so what? my, my grandfather who passed away last year, he was 95. He looked great. My grandmother's yeah. 95. She's still driving, kicking butt. My mother wow. has had health, health issues, but 
does not look old. My real father, he looked, he passed away many years ago when I was in my 20s, but he looked, he had like a beard when he was like a senior. He lost his hair when he was 20. He looked very weathered for a long time in his life. So yeah. I definitely yeah. leaned towards my mother's genes, I, thankfully, because I thought I was losing my hair. I mean, I can't grow a beard. So yeah, opposite of yeah. him. It's just rare you run into a 38 year old man who, who could say was 25 and get away with yeah, it. You know, sure. like I'm wearing fucking television makeup right now. I'm wearing a hat, right? Like <laughs> my kid's dad is fucking weathered. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're going to pick like six or seven fights here, guys. And uh, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble, but full disclosure, I'm looking at a draft two of a fight card and the Bantamweight co-main event says Chris Gutierrez versus TBD. So mm -hmm. I don't believe he is fighting Javed Basharat this weekend. So we are not going to pick that fight, but we have several others. And as you guys know, on this program, Whenever there's a fight involving a Ray Longo pupil, we pick the fight to that end. Featured prelim in the featherweight division. Hara Lampos, Gregor Yu, minus 218. Toshiomi Kazama, plus 180. Kazama, right out of Tokyo, yeah. Japan. He fought twice in the UFC last year. Got knocked out both times. Brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Eight finishes. Uh, taking on Longo's guy this weekend. Who do you like? Yeah, so I'm going to go Lampos because that's what Dongo did. I'm not even going to fucking attempt it. Uh -huh. But uh, listen, this guy hits hard. He, he, he's, he's a thick, he's a solid guy. He's dense. He has a couple leg kick uh, finishes, so he kicks hard. His debut, though, against Chad Anheimler, who I'm mispronouncing his name as well. He just, he rushed for too many takedowns. It's like he didn't trust himself. And when he did stand up, he just was like, all I need is one shot. And he forced everything. I want to see a little more flow, a little more not forcing the takedowns because Kazama's good on the ground. He's good off his back. He's good on top, but he's chinny. You can put him out. He's been put out in the last two times in the first round. I like Lampos here by knockout. I think that might be something, you know, I might be playing and place your bets. Um, but I, yeah, give me Longo's guy by knockout. I think he's, he's, he's going to get it done here. I think he's going to stop him. Ken Flo, I root against Longo's guys. I'm rooting for Toshiomi Kazama this weekend. He's plus 180. Who do you have? <laughs> Well, it's going to be tough for the Japanese fighter. I, I think that, you know, as Brian talked about, um, he is chinny. And to make matters worse, he's like ready and willing to just stand and yeah. trade. And that's never a good combination. So he's got to be careful there. And I guess to make matters worse, it's not going to be easy to take down Yaralampos, the ferocious Grirorio. Huh. <laughs> so so, uh, so I think that's going to be a little tough. So I, I, I like uh, Grirorio. Very good, or Gregorio. I don't know how the hell you pronounce it. Hadalampos, give me Hadalampos. I like Hada him Lampos. in this matchup. You know, comes from that karate background. He does throw hard. Um, doesn't throw as many combinations as as uh, mm -hmm. Toshiomi, um, but um, you know, I, I think he's got decent takedowns as well. He's got good positioning. Uh, doesn't do a whole lot of stupid stuff on the ground. So I, I think um, he can hang on the ground with uh, Toshiomi as well. So give me Hadalampos. Love it. I just love having fun with the not ultra sensitive Ray Longo, but you can be sure if he loses, I'm buying a fucking Japan flag <laughs> and celebrating <laughs> on this podcast next week. Uh, main card opener, fellas, at flyweight. Alan Nascimento, modest 205. Jafel Filio, plus 170. Puro Oso, Alan Nascimento, trains out of the famed Shootbox Academy under Diego Lima. He's won two in a row, mm -hmm. as has his opponent, BP. The Fly Guys kicking off the main card live on ESPN. Which way are you going here? This is a really, I'm going to keep it short because I really want to hear Kenny break this one down. Both these guys are jujitsu guys. I see him as Nascimento more positional and, and Jafel feel more, I'm going to go for it and get the win by submission. Um, technique wise, again, I'm going to leave that to Kenfo. I'm going to lean Nascimento. I think he is better with his grappling, a little bit stronger in there, but he could get caught. And if, the, if in a lot of, we see a lot of grapplers sometimes play out on the feet. So it'd be interesting to see. I'm not really, I'm not going to back up the brink struck on, on Nascimento, but that is going to be my pick. Ken Flo, put down the Chelsea Chandler film just for a second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, We're talking about a couple of Brazilians. On, I'm like, okay. deep, deep in it. Okay, fine. <laughs> so Jafel Filio, former Shooto Brazil champion, exciting fighter. He's also two and one in the UFC. Two straight wins by submission. What do you think, Ken Flo? Nascimento the favorite or Jafel Filio the dog for you? I think this is a great fight. Um, you know, not only because of the way that they match up, but also, you know, based on what they've done, they're both three on one in their last four fights. Uh, you know, I, I think that Nascimento has faced the higher level of competition and he's got a strong argument that he could be on a great win streak right now. I'm even longer win streak, yeah. uh, based on the fact that, you know, that, that split decision loss 
uh, to Ulambekov could have definitely gone his way. Um, there was another split decision loss that he had not too far from that loss. So this is a very good fighter uh, who loves to go for it. And I think things are very interesting on the ground. I think Nascimento um, is very good positionally. He has excellent sweeps and reversals off of his back from his guard. He has good submission attacks as well, but I think that's pretty accurate, Brian. The fact that Filio might be more potent with his mm -hmm. submission game. Um, but in that process, because he's not as good positionally, that's where Nascimento might be able to take advantage and maybe get a TKO or counter with the, some kind of a submission. So I don't know what's going to happen on the ground between those two. And uh, I think both those guys are pretty good on the feet as well. Nascimento has a, has a tendency, it seems, to kind of get thrown or taken off of his feet sometimes because he gets a little too aggressive. But um, I think he's a very good fighter. I think Filio is as well. I just want to see more out of Filio. Like I, I still, I'm still not sure exactly how good he is. Um, this is one of those fights where we're we're gonna find out. So, love this fight. I'm leaning towards Nascimento based on his experience and higher level of competition. Uh, however, like Brian, I, I'm I'm not gonna uh, be putting a whole lot of money on this one. Really well so done. Good. Every single so handicapper in the position of Brian Peachy or Kenny Florian would like to be afforded the opportunity of another 72 or 90 hours. And mm -hmm. just so everybody listening, whenever you're listening or watching this knows, these guys are doing this prep shortly after Umar Nurmagomedov has his hand raised and bringing it to you on Monday morning, six days before the fight. Thank you, boys. Moving on to the women's band and weight division. Yana Santos, minus 142. Chelsea Chandler, plus 120. So Santos Bry, mm -hmm. formerly Kunitskaya. She's lost three in a row, last of which a split loss to Carol Hosa, July 1 of last year. Her last win, long time ago, Ketlin Vieta, February of 2021. But she's favored here against Chelsea Chandler out of Stockton, California. Who do you like, BP? 209, baby. 209 That's representing. Right. I love it. Chelsea Chandler. There's one bad optic. She fought Norma or not, yeah, Norma, uh, Norma Dumont, Dumont. and yeah. she turned her back in a couple of the striking exchanges. And that makes me just cringe. You have to be comfortable when you're exchanging, especially at the level of the UFC. However, she's pretty, you know, complimentarily thick for this division. She is pretty good size. And so is Santos. Santos is more tall <laughs> And, and and Chelsea, yeah. you know, she's complimentary, she's complimentary thick. thick. I'm not trying to insult the, the, the lady because I think she wins here. I like the dog. I like Chelsea Tanner. I think that's exactly what she is. She is a dog. I think Yana Santos, I know she had a baby. She got married, hasn't really came back and looked good. And she doesn't really hunt for takedowns. She's the one that gets taken down. She tries to use volume to win, but there's not enough volume, in my opinion, there. The last three fights we've seen her. Um, her striking is pretty good, but it's not great. I think Chelsea Chandler can make this a dog fight. 209, Stockton slapper. You know, yeah, we're going to see a classic Stockton. You know, they all talk the same from Stockton, which is amazing. They all got a little bit of Nate Diaz in them. Uh, I like Chelsea Chandler here. I like her probably by decision. I don't see a finish happening, but give me the dog. Get out your 209 tattoos, folks. Get them out. Yeah. We want to see all of them. Yeah. Ken Flo, Brian knows chicks. <laughs> Nose thick chicks, evidently. <laughs> um, Complimentary thick. <laughs> who do you have for us on uh, Santos and Chandler Kenflo? Man, crazy Chelsea Handler. I, she used to have a show. <laughs> right. Uh, she she was kind of funny for a little bit. Really falling now on hard time. Yeah. Oh, Chelsea Chandler, not <laughs> Chelsea Handler. My this whole this all research is garbage. Now, listen, <laughs> I, I think that uh, Chandler is. Um, I think she's going to be able to use her size, her strength here to stop some of the takedowns. I think a lot of this fight is going to be fought in the clinch. It's going to be up against the cage somewhere. That's where Santos is comfortable. And I think actually that's kind of where Chandler is, is more comfortable as well. I think Chandler can take this fight to the ground. I, I think there might be a good opportunity here uh, to, put, to put money down. But am I going to do it? Uh, I, I, I don't know chicks, guys. I, I, I definitely don't <laughs> yeah, know chicks. Yeah. So I'm going to stay, stay away from this one. But I like Chandler here. Santos has had a rough go. Um, you look at their last four fights. Um, and yes, Santos has faced tougher competition, I think. But um, yeah, I don't love this fight for her. All right, next up, Chepe Machine Gun Matascal, minus 218, Damon Jackson, plus 180. So what a start to the UFC career for our guy, Chepe Matascal, 3-0. Now coming up on this challenge with another good human being, Fortis MMA's UFC-tested veteran, Damon Jackson. The Leech, 13th UFC appearance here, won the last one by split, Brian, mm -hmm. against Alexander Hernandez. 
Damon Jackson, it's been a resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. He's won five of his last seven in pretty good form. He is the older guy here, though, against Chepe, Machine Gun, Modiscal, BP. Which way you going? It's been a resurrection of his hairline, too. My boy went to Turkey. Uh, that's right. Handsome old guy, eh? Uh, uh, no more backward hats uh, for him. Uh, listen, Chepe is a savage, dude. Like, I slept on Chepe, and then I looked. You know, I, I, I didn't pick him his first two UFC fights. But then you look at his record before the UFC. Yes, he has six losses. But who are those losses, too? Just absolute studs who are all in the UFC besides one guy. The dude's nails, he's in, you know what I mean? He's been knocked out before. He knows how to handle a punch. He rolls with punches very well. He's comfortable in the pocket. He can mix up takedowns as well. Damon Jackson's very good everywhere. He's long. He has some decent striking defense. Eh, I'm a little worried about it. He's good on the ground. Sometimes he hunts for takedowns a little too much for being that long kind of body. It's kind of hard to kind of get under hips at times. Problem with Damon Jackson is at an under, he, he cashes an underdog quite a bit. But he's a little inconsistent. Sometimes he's got this dog and he'll go in there three rounds, bloody. He'll win it. Other times he might fade and kind of get put away. So I really don't know what Damon Jackson could have show up, but it really doesn't matter because I think Chepe Menescal has him everywhere here. I mean, I think Damon Jackson is more the potent finisher when it comes to submissions, but I don't think he's going to take it there. I think Chepe is going to play bully ball in the clinch. He's going to piece him up and then he's going to probably get a finish here. But I like Chepe Menescal big time. Yeah, that pre-UFC strength of schedule for Crazy. Jose Chepe Matascal, absolutely insane. He represents Cicero, Illinois, and uh, incidentally, they now have a champion in Chicago. Hey! Good game! Hello! Muhammad! Yeah, they got a champion in Chicago yeah, now. Bilal Muhammad, undisputed <laughs> UFC welterweight champion. Ken Flo, Chepe Matascal, the betting favorite, or Damon Jackson, the underdog for you? Yeah, you know, um, I, I faded Chepe Matascal a, a bunch Um but I, I think I'm on the Che 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 Chepe train right now. Uh, <laughs> Damon Jackson, yeah, I think Brian um, did a great breakdown. Um, I think Damon, um, it, it's hard to to know which Damon is going to show up. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, striking wise, uh, he, he's got to be careful here against Mario Skull. I, I think his best bet is to try to put Mario Skull on his back, but. I don't know if he can keep him there. Myers Golf does not stop, dude. This guy's like a Terminator. I think his conditioning, his pacing, his striking is going to be the difference. So uh, I like Chippe. I like nice. him a lot. Nice. All right. Next up at Welterweight. Left hand of God. We love that nickname. Do we not be so left hand of God? Danny Barlow. I mean, when you think about it as a commentator, having a nickname like that with which to work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I worked it into his last fight, but I should have. Left hand of God, Danny Barlow, minus 325, taking on Nikolai Veratenikov, who is plus 260. So, Brian, mm -hmm. we'll start with you on this one. Barlow out of Memphis, Tennessee, 29 years old. I think he's pretty fucking promising. Huge UFC debut stoppage win over Josh Quinlan. That came at UFC 298. Now he takes on the Ukrainian Veratenikov. He fights under Rafael Cordero, Kings MMA, Huntington Beach, California and make it his UFC debut here at BP, which way? Love this fight. I'm so glad we did pick up Memphis, Tennessee. My Memphis, Tennessee. He <laughs> said that 20 times after he won over Josh Quinlan. I love me some Danny Barlow. I've watched a ton of film on this guy. I've seen his highlights on Twitter, um, his Instagram. He puts stuff up. He is so fluid, and he moves so clean. He's 8-0. There's still questions, obviously. What's his grappling like? I think his cardio checked out. He's coming off a three-round knockout over a guy, Josh Quinlan, Quinlan, who's never been knocked out. So I think we we check some boxes there, but when it comes to the wrestling, we have some box uh, some check. But he's going against Nikolai here, who is a striker himself. Stiff as a board, though. Very heavy power, but he's stiff. He doesn't move like Barlow. He's also always bigger than every opponent he's ever fought. Enter Danny Barlow to the same height, but Danny Barlow has a five inch reach advantage. Um, the left hand of God is great. Danny, the whole oh. motherfucking show, Barlow. I mean, I love this guy. I can't get enough of him. I like Danny Barlow in this spot. I, I'm, I was going to go a thousand right off the rip over Danny Barlow. Wow. I'm not. I, I've since walked walk back the wheels here because Danny is still only eight no coming off a broken arm. But I like where he's at. I like his confidence. I think this guy's a star. And uh, as long as the grappling and the ground game are there because we haven't seen it, I think this is a dude at one seventy that you got to look out for. Uh, I, I'm all over Danny Barlow here. Left hand. I'm the real God. article. What you see is what you get. <laughs> I didn't intend to hit the fucking John Candy button in the middle I of your it. I, prediction. You got it. But maybe Danny Barlow is the real article, Ken Flo. Maybe Danny Barlow is the real article. What do you think? He might be. Danny Barlow. Um, I Left think, hand of God, Ken Flo. Left hand of fucking I know, God. I know. Strike kid. 
I, I think I think he's uh I think he's a very good striker. I love the way he moves. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's very calm. He's very fluid, as Brian was talking about. And Veratinikov, I, I think that um, I don't know. He's like your typical MMA fighter. It's mm-hmm. just like he does a bunch of stuff okay, and there's not a whole lot else to kind of look for and and you know and maybe things have changed um but i think this is a really good fight for for danny um i think he's going to be way faster out there i think he's going to be way more accurate out there i think he has uh more power actually still um and i i think this is a good fight for him to look good so give me yeah. danny ballo love it yeah and i think that probably dovetails with Internal promotional opinion seems as though this was a late addition to the main card and potentially a showcase spot for Barlow against Vera Tenikov. Perhaps Rafael Cordero it was supposed has to something be, to say. Barlow was supposed to that. fight Usho Medic, would have been fucking fireworks. Medic's another, uh, that would have been another sick. guy with ties yeah. to Kings MMA, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so, yeah. The doctor, Udosh Medic. Mm-hmm. All right. Main event, boys. Ken Fole lead Woo-hoo. us off in the heavyweight division. Ninth ranked Sergei Spivak. Minus 155, taking on number eight, Marcin Tabora, who comes back plus 130. Kenny, rematch of a fight that took place February 29th, 2020. So that was right before COVID-19 took over the United States. Tabora did win that fight by unanimous decision. Since then, though, as you know, Kenny Spivak has been more the story. He's gone six and two since that loss, really responded in kind after that defeat, and has only lost to Cirogan and Tom Aspinall since. So... He's favored here to beat Tabor in the rematch. How do you see it playing out, Ken Flo? Yeah, you know, I think that um, th- that first match may be telling. That first fight may be telling. It's hard because there was a there was a point where Spivak was looking really good uh, with his takedowns. But as you look at some of the records, you know, or the guys he was going against, they were really good matchups for him. There were guys that were really kind of just strikers. They didn't have a whole lot of grappling to back up their games, and it's what allowed Spivak to look very, very good and then enter Cyril Gunn, and it looked like it was Spivak's first fight. I mean, he looked mm. terrible out there. Um, And not even it's like, it's not even about the win or the loss. He looked terrible, in my opinion, because he wasn't even able to really get to a good clinch. And when he was trying, it just looked bad. It looked like he was diving in. His striking really was exposed. And of course, he's going against Cyril Gaon, one of the best, he- one of the best heavyweights in the world. So n- no knock in losing against Cyril Gaon, but it was the way that he went about it, which makes me a little bit nervous. And then you have Tybura, who, you know, he's, you know, not always so consistent, but I think he's way more consistent and way more complete than Sergei Spivak. So. For me, I- I'm going to rely on Ty Bor to get it done. I-, I think things may or may not change with it being five rounds. However, um, I'm leaning towards Ty Bora. I just can't wait to see what Marcin Tabora has for the lettuce <laughs> upstairs. I mean, what the f- yeah. yeah? What was he doing last night? You look great, Marcin, if you're listening. Yeah, <laughs> stole off, but geez, what was he doing, man? Anyway, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Tabora is nearly 10 years Spivak senior. I know that factors in for some. He makes his 20th UFC appearance here. This closed nearly a pick him four mm. years ago. Not that far from it here. How do you see this heavyweight main event event playing out? Birthday boy. Well, the first the first fight, Spivak didn't even go for a takedown. It's like that's your best weapon, and he didn't even attempt one. Tabora hasn't really fought heavily grapplers. He's the one usually taking guys down. He's heavy on top. He's a big guy. And I'm so glad you brought up his hair. He explained it. In the post fight that he's losing yeah. it on this side. So he got whatever, dude. I mean, you look like a psycho, but hey, you got the win. Cool. You got the win. Yeah. Hey, it works. It works. But uh, Spivak, you know, to steal a quote from Sam Darnold, he was seeing Ghost against Cyril Gaon. I don't know what he was shooting for for some of those. I mean, Cyril Gaon was that much more <laughs> fast, faster and athletic than Spivak. And it was, it was eye opening, right? But this is a guy who has improved. Since training out of you know Eastern Europe, now he's in Vegas and he's improving. And people say he's a workhorse and everything like that. He needs to grapple here. There it is. <laughs> I mean, it's the I'm holding up my it's phone. Like a, it's I'm like so a modern, distracted. It's like a modern what Marcin? Oh, it's that's, something out oh, of the '80s. I, nothing okay. out of the '80s. And mm-hmm. by the way, Barlow, he's making rat tails cool again. By the way, he does. I, have, I, love I had a, I had a rat tail as a kid. My grandpa cut it off. That is going to be a future bet for me. 
uh, not this fight, but a future bet. If I lose, I'll shave my head like fucking Marching Tabora. Uh, I was going to wait for Kenny, and I'm glad Kenny went first. I'm going to go opposite. There's going to be no action for me, but per Evan Longoria, I do have to make a selection. It is going to be Sergei, right. uh, Sergei Spivak. I do think if he gets a takedown, he can he can do something there. He's the younger guy. I don't know if he's more athletic, but um, let's just hope he's working on his game because, man, anything's going to be improvement from that gone fight, like Kenny said. But, uh, yeah, give me Spivak, but not confident. All right, that's it for the main event challenge. It is now time for Place Your Bets, brought to you by JohnAnnick.com, where you can still enjoy 15% off your Anakin and Florian podcast and one more sleep merchandise with promo code UFC304. Also, Bilal Muhammad's championship merchandise exclusively available at JohnAnnick.com. Proceeds from that design go to Gaza. All right, we will update the standings after UFC no. Fight Night, San Hagen versus Nurmagomedov. Pretty clean week for Petrie in terms of not much mathematics. You were at plus 5, 65, 31. You hit your big bet on Davis and Figueroa at minus 166. 600 paid you 361, 45. You did lose your remaining $400 on Elvis Brenner, Alonzo Menafield, and that flyer on Tony Ferguson by submission. So minus $38.55 for the week. Year to date, still north of $526. Awesome. Team Florian was at plus 174, 27. Hit your straight 300 on Azamat Mirzakhanov at minus 205. That paid 146.34. You lost your remaining three straight wagers. Lupi Godinez, Marlon Chito Vera, and Corey Sanhagen. Weekly total minus 553.66 year to date. Minus 379.39. Petrie's lead is now $906.15 as we come up on UFC Fight Night. Tibora versus Spivak 2. You guys have $1,000 to spend. Kenny and I joked in the pre-show meeting that Maybe you guys should only get five hundred dollars for this particular card, but of course not. You get a it's dime thin. for a thousand bucks. Yep. And Bri, you have the lead, so you can either defer or make your selections first. Let's keep it hot. I'll go first. I like I like going first. I like rolling out. So listen, I talked about earlier left hand to God. I'm gonna be digging my left hand in my wallet, getting this money. Danny, uh-huh. the whole motherfucking show, Barlow. Don't call him Dan Barlow. Don't call him Ken Florian. It's Kenny Florian. It's Danny Barlow. <laughs> $500 on Danny Barlow. Um, I love that play. They give me 400 on Chepe. I just think Chepe's a dog in there, man. I think he's hungry. I think he's going to get that finish there. And then since Katie Ledecky is killing everything, time for me to jump in the old prop pool. Let's Ooh. go Lampos Gregorio by KO. Prop available, not yet on DraftKings Sportsbook, but 100 bucks. 100 bucks. All right, nicely done, BP, yes. separating your action across three wagers this weekend. Ken Flo, you have 1000 American dollars to spend. Where's your action for UFC Fight Night? BP was on fire. I think we're aligned here a little bit, Brian. Mm-hmm. Um, Good. Give me 400 on Grigorio or whatever. Nice. Grigorio. Gregorio. <laughs> Gregory, I owe you. All right, dude, that I've guy. been Sorry. so sick, and every time you do that, it like it it unleashes this cough. So you like <laughs> Lampos though for four hundred. Give me, give me oh, Lampos, okay. dude, four hundred, and give me six hundred on my guy Chip and my Rascal. Yep, there it is. I'm on the Machine train. Gun. Take me home. Machine gun. Love right. it. Nicely done, Brian Petrie, yes. host of the MMA Takes podcast. Big gun. Appreciate your time at Brian Petrie MMA. Anything uh, else before we let you fly? Nice t-shirt. Thank you. Nice t-shirt. t-shirt fits like a glove. Uh, I'll probably say this next week, but next week on the MMA Takes, Takes podcast, go subscribe. We're almost at 2,000 subscribers. I'm having the one and only Evan Longoria break down UFC 305 wow. live. Last time we did it pre-recorded. This time we're doing it live. And the future Hall of Famer psyched. He's texting me like, "Listen, he I knows know, the so game, dude. He knows the game. He know he beat He's me an last MMA time. nerd. We play a little game. You know, you you get your lock of the night, your dog of the night. And we we tally up the points, whatever. He beat me last time. So this guy is a fucking sharp. Uh, we had good chemistry. So next week, next Thursday, August fifteenth, I'll probably promote it again next week. I'm gonna have number three. Evan Longoria on the show live. Unless he gets a call from sure, like the Boston sure. Red Sox. He's a busy guy, right? And to step out of retirement. Absolutely. But. That's good. Long go and the big gun. All right, yes. BP, we'll talk to you uh, on Sunday for you, UFC 305 selections, my man. Absolutely. Appreciate it. See you, boys. There he is, Brian Petrie, with us every week here on the Anakin Florian podcast. Got that victory <laughs> smile going. <laughs> I mean, what I would give to be celebrating my 12th UFC win in the Pacific Northwest as UFC welterweight contender Michael Chiesa now joins us on the Anakin Florian podcast. 
got to be one of these really nice days in your life. And hopefully you can enjoy the fruits, right? To yeah. come home, to wake up, have a good cup of black coffee. Hopefully you're not putting shit in it. And uh, and just enjoy the fruits, man. It's got to be a good day to be Michael Chiesa. Hey, you can't forget about the uh, the morning flower to go with it, John. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, man, it feels good to be home. It's been a really, really long road to get here, man, um, since the Neil Magny fight. And, you know, I, I look at, like, the last three fights prior to Tony and – you know, the Sean Brady fight, I feel like I competed well, but the Luke a fight and particularly the Holland fight, just feeling like I really beat myself. I think they're both tremendous fighters, but I think that I really just kind of shot myself in the foot in some ways in the way that I competed. And so to come home and uh, have I surrendered myself from the result, it was just all about going out and just like doing my best. I put so much pressure on myself to win that it's like I need to just forget about winning and losing and just focus on how I perform. I would, you know, if I came home and Tony got the best of me, but I just feel like I fought my best, um, I, I wouldn't have this smile on my face, but I would yeah. definitely be, I would be happy with myself. I'd be content with myself. Um, but man, got the dub a lot wow. faster than I thought I would. So I'm fucking elated. It's great. <laughs> and you should be. Shit, I'm freaking jacked right now, man. <laughs> well, God, at least, but it. in terms of the philosophy and the mentality, it's yeah. one thing to actually spout that out there. It's another thing to actually be able to be of a calm mind and execute in a spot like that, bro. As your friend, I would tell you, yeah, it's nice in theory, right? When you think about beating Tony Ferguson, but there was a lot of downside potentially to this fight and a lot of pressure on you as a near six to one favorite. You know, I think even the legendary Tony Ferguson, if you lose to a guy who's lost seven or so fights in a row, that's not a great look. So how were you able to sort of compartmentalize that and uh, keep the mental in the right place? Because there were buckets of pressure upon you Saturday. Yeah. I, you know, honestly, I feel like, I feel like I would have got a lot of flack if this fight went out of the second round. And to be honest with you, I didn't think I would finish him in the first. I predicted a later finish. I feel like I would, Let's just rewind. Let's go back eight years. Let's go back eight years to when I fought him the first when I was supposed to fight him the first time. That's what was that just the fact that I was I was training for Tony amidst the, the crazy 12 fight win streak that he was on. I asked for that fight. I wanted to fight him. Nobody else did. And I wanted the ultimate test. And at that time, Tony was the guy. Things, you know, got injured that camp, got pulled from it. But to get the second call to get the opportunity to fight him, what made it easy was I just went back to that place. I didn't look at where he's at now. I'm like, let's go back. We're starting camp from where we left off eight years ago. The same game plan, the same tactics, the same mentality. So I was preparing for that Tony Ferguson. So I honestly, I didn't feel any pressure from it. Like I didn't feel any pressure from where his current status of his career is or anything like that. Because to me, he is always going to be Tony Ferguson. I'm like, I, it's like, it's kind of like how I feel about BJ Penn. Like people are so dismissive of BJ Penn. When to me, he's in my top five for greatest lightweights of all time. You have to look at him for his skills and what he's done. As a fighter ages, that doesn't take away their skills. It takes away their ability to execute those skills. Father time slows you down. So it was easy for me. Just go right back to where we left off in 2016. Start that camp just right where we left off. And just keep the mentality for the boogeyman. The lightweight boogeyman who is also mm. going to be go down in history as one of the greatest lightweights of all time. I think that's a great mentality, man. Um, wh when you locked up with him uh, and kind of exchanged some grappling positions with him, did you feel comfortable at that point? You know, it seems like you look like, anyway, a more put-together welterweight. Well, I, I, I definitely, if you go by the metrics, um, and I'm, I'm very... I'm very serious in the way that I train in terms of like the numbers, you know, strength and conditioning is a big part of my game. Um, by the numbers, I'm one of the strongest welterweights on the roster if you just go off the metrics. And I know that slanging weights isn't going to win you a fight. Sure. But to me, it's been it's been important for my growth, especially when I went up to 170 pounds. So um, there's really not a lot of guys I've locked up with where I haven't felt that way. Um, but I just knew the biggest part about it was staying calm. I went back and watched. I, I don't. I don't watch my fights. Win or lose, I'm just not big on watching my fights. I'm too analytical. I'm too picky. Um, it's a gift and a curse that comes with my with my mind. Um, but my uncle Joe, who's a sports psychologist, who I give so much praise to, Doctor Joe Carella. Uh, I am so blessed to have him in my, in my in my life. But he chewed me out because I won't watch my losses. And he finally just just like just two weeks before this fight was like, all right. Oh. 
I'm tired of you not watching your losses. Like, Michael, you are shooting yourself in the foot. Look at an NFL team. Do you think when they lose a game, they don't go back and watch the film to see what they did wrong? They know what they did wrong, but they're not seeing it. What the fuck are you doing? So I finally was, I bit the bullet, went back and watched the Kevin Holland fight. It was particularly, it was like, what was I thinking? I was all over the place. I was moving way too much. I was not setting anything up. So that's just going back and seeing the losses and seeing how, I knew how I lost, but I just didn't see the process and, and what led to that. And so that's what led me to, to, to give me the affirmation to go out there, be calm, be comfortable. The entries will come. you got to set them up. I can't force everything. The guy puts me in a bad position like a dart stroke. I can't force offense. I have to use defense. So learning how to be calmer, slow things down, even not sprinting to the octagon like I usually do. Like, let's do things to just keep myself calm. So I can execute, so I can think, see, see things coming better and find it, my find my entries. It was very evident, man. You looked very composed, but it, I think a lot of that composure also came from what seemed to me to be um, more technical striking. It seemed like you were very balanced out there. You had a great stance. You were kind of not, uh, as you mentioned, forcing things. You were waiting for things to develop, and um, I, I thought your striking never looked better. Thank you. Um, that's another thing is I got to be more confident in my full set of skills. Uh, and I've always had that in my back pocket. I've just never showed it. And I'm kind of glad I have it now at this point because I'm getting to this latter stage of my career where I kind of, this wasn't going to be my last fight. That was never the plan. But to be honest with you, if Tony beat me, there's a good chance I, you know, I probably wouldn't compete again. As, as an MMA fighter, I would move on. Like if I can't get past him, what am I doing here? I'm just going to get myself hurt. But I made a deal with my wife where she doesn't care what I do. She's going to support me no matter what. But I told her, I go, however long this fight takes is really going to dictate how much longer I fight. Mm. If I got to go to a decision and it's 29, 28, it might be time to just maybe, maybe have one more. But I said, the shorter this fight is, if I can finish him, that's going to dictate how long my wow. career is going to go on for. <laughs> so I didn't expect the first round finish. I expected something late in the second. So I was thinking, okay, we'll get a couple more in. But with things going the way they did, John, yeah, I ain't stopping anytime soon, buddy. I feel like just now that I'm coming into my own, circling back to what you uh, mentioned, Kenny, about my stand-up, not having a set of skills I haven't displayed very much of, a newfound confidence, a newfound approach to how I compete and how I prepare, I really want to make another run at it. I really do. That's I don't great, care. Man. The fans can be dejecting. I don't give a shit what they say. The, the only thing that matters to me, man, is the people around me, the people that you guys, my peers that respect me, the people in my fraternity, my family, my friends, um, they don't care if I win or lose. They're going to love me the same regardless. So now yeah. it's like I got all these skills and all these things I haven't shown in my continued evolution. I got to make another run at it. I just feel like I can, I can get myself back in the title mix. Michael Chiesa with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. And you did the segue for me. And by the way, there's the soundbite. I don't know if you said that after in your post-fight media scrum, but just in terms of the length of the fight relative to how long your career could potentially last after the fact, that's really powerful stuff. So we were text messaging privately. And mm -hmm. one thing that I was sort of sitting on is just like that you have a lot of fight left. And a lot of our conversations, at least over the last 12 months, have been about your back. Mm -hmm. and your relative health or lack thereof. So yeah. now seeing this fight go swimmingly and quickly, and you talk about having a lot of fight left, and I got some career retrospective stuff that I'll get to in a minute, but very encouraging for me as your friend to hear you say that. So what's the deal with your back? And I know Ken Flo is a back injury guy, wants to hear this shit as well. It's been good, man. Um, you just have to learn how to train as you get older. I've never been the guy to like shy away from hard work. I'm always the guy that wants to try to throw 10 extra pounds on a, on a squat. Yeah. Or just, I'm always trying to push it a little bit. And I think a big thing for me is I have to just put, I, I trust my coaches. I always have, but like when they tell me like, okay, you're done sparring. I'm like, well, I feel good. I want to go one more round, you know? So I've always been the guy like in that sense where it's not, it's not like I don't trust them, but it's like, well, I want to push myself a little harder. Mm. So I think that that's been the problem. So now it's like, I fully put everything in their hands. Yeah. Mind, mindless training is Daniel Cormier says if my coach says you're sparring three rounds you're only doing three rounds it's even like when we were doing the shakeout the day of the fight it was a super short shakeout and I wanted to keep doing stuff and Rick yeah. was like hey you're done I go okay yeah so that, I think that that's a big part of keeping my back healthy is just listen to my coaches if they tell me yeah. to be, done, be done training for the day be done if they tell me you're only doing this you're only doing that so um and just listening to my body 
if my back starts to bark at me and I start to get those precursors, Kenny, you know what I'm talking about? There's certain things you feel where you're like, I feel like something's coming on. Um, I yeah. just got to listen to my body more and just trust my coach. Yeah. So since I have two jujitsu guys in the room, and by the way, Michael Chiesa is still ascending when it comes to the belts and the gi and all that business, right? But since I have two jujitsu guys here, right? When Pahumpa tells me that Brazilian jujitsu is going to change my life, he's not talking about my back, <laughs> right? <laughs> it may it's, change right? your back too, though. That's the thing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. last time I saw Ken Flo, he was uh, threatening to maybe never training jujitsu again he's got a fucking jujitsu room in his house because his back was not in good shape kenny any update on that real quick before uh, we get the, back to the champion the back feels absolutely phenomenal now i'm like i, I you know it's like it's like that girl that keeps cheating on you i'm like i want to go back but she's so <laughs> yeah. she's right there yeah. all i have to do is just I grapple i got all these so it. Uh, i want to i want to train again but yeah, yeah. dude Jiu -jitsu. it really sucks that like it's been effective. I, I mean, Mike knows all about it. I don't want to sit here and whine. But uh, All right, oh, so here fine. we go, yeah. Mike. 12th UFC win. Strength of schedule is outstanding. I really think that history is going to look back fondly at your legacy, right? So here are the wins. Rafael Dos Fucking Anjos, Benil Dariush, Neil Magny, Carlos Condit, Diego Sanchez. These are not opponents. These are wins. Ally yeah. Quinta, fucking Massa Randuba, Brazilian Redwood, Francisco Trinaldo, Jim Miller, Tony Ferguson, never mind the fact that you face the likes of Sean Brady, Anthony Pettis, Jorge Gamebred, Masvidal, and Kevin Holland. So, hey, as your tough live compatriot and a guy who is rooted for you now pretty fucking hard for 12 years, man, you know, this win doesn't put a capstone on your career because you're still going. But this win is a, a big one for you to move past Tony in a couple of minutes. And and now we'll see, you know, what name shows up in your bracket, you know? Yeah, I'm excited to see what what shakes out, you know, Um I think that obviously I'm not going to get a ranked guy next. I'm going to kind of, you know, have some conversations with Sean. The good thing is welterweight's booming right now. Everybody's fighting. There's movement. Guys are changing in the rankings. We're seeing some good stuff. Big shout out to our guy. You already know who I'm going to say. Ah, Give him a I mean, there's your guy. Fucking you so know? happy for him. So it's a good time to be a welterweight. So obviously this month I'm busy. I got a lot of death shows and stuff. You know, there's yeah. a few, few names in mind. One thing in my legacy I want to do is I would like to be like the great Kenny Florian. And I would like to test the waters, maybe just for a one-off when it's all said and done. Not now, but uh, I'd like to fight one fight at, at middleweight. I'd like hey, to see. Of course you should. Yeah. Hey, and <laughs> dude, Max Holloway, immortalized behind me, has yeah. been saying for years that he wants to take a fight at 85 before he's done. <laughs> so, yes, you should. Savage fight. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Right. And when you talk about commitment, man, I'm going to turn this camera behind me. This is how committed I am to continuing to fight. You see that huge building back there? I just yes. built that this training camp. So we're going Camp Kiesa 2.0. Yes, it's going to be like the Spokane, Washington Performance Institute. <laughs> nice. I'm committed. I'm, I'm committed to the game, dude. Like I'm still I by all means don't think uh, I want to fight beyond my 40s. But if the numbers look good, the sparring looks good. Yeah, I'm about, I'm about to take I feel like I'm about to take my career to a. I, I don't want to say a new level because it's so cliche, but I feel like we're going to see a definite different version of myself going forward. So, dude, I love it, man. Come on, come on. All. <laughs> dude, I want one of those Camp Kiesa T-shirts. I'm a size medium that I don't have to wear <laughs> fucking mid Cal's Daniel Cormier wrestling camp T-shirt. So if you and your manager, Danny Rube, could somehow get me some Camp Kiesa shirts. But yeah, man, yeah, it's very exciting. And yeah, I do think if you prioritize the back and sort of train smart, you're a big fight for a lot of people, man. I mean, don't make me run through the wins list again, right? And waste yeah. everybody's time. But like, bro, when you say it's not going to be ranked opposition next, it almost sounds to me like you've already been informed that. And to me, I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me, no. right? Like when yeah. you start barking about Colby Covington, like that's mm -hmm. not totally out of the realm of possibility. Like I, you know, yeah, you're scoffing at that, but yeah. why would no, you, I'm why would you not get a ranked guy though? Why? I'm not, why? I'm not, I'm not scoffing at it. That's just the freaking fight I want so bad. And it's like, as bad as I want to get in the rankings, I can't emphasize it enough. Like a lot of people like Randy Brown said, Mike's just chasing higher ranked guys. When I call out Colby Covington, that couldn't be any further from the truth. There's a backstory behind this. And it's not like it's a bad blood thing between him and I. Obviously, nobody likes the guy as a competitor because he says a lot of foul stuff. Um, but my high school wrestling coach, Dusty Roberts, his brother, Kevin Roberts, was Colby Covington's college wrestling coach. So there's this like thing where I'm like, let's find out who is the best welterweight in the Pacific Northwest. You can keep your number. 
I don't care. But I don't want Colby's number. I'll, yeah. earn, I'll earn my way back up to the top. From the bottom to the top, I don't give a shit. But I just want to fight the guy because it's like for people out here in the great Pacific Northwest, like that's what they want to see. My people want to see me fight Colby Covington. And I think that we're long overdue for a show in the Pacific Northwest. We haven't done Seattle since 2017, I believe. Yeah, 2017. We haven't done Portland uh, in the same amount of time, I believe. Yeah. Let's go back to the Pacific Northwest. And if you're going to come back to the West Coast, this part of the great United States of America, there is not a better main event you could put together than me and Colby Covington. Keep your number. I don't give a shit. Let's just find out who's the best goddamn welterweight in the great Pacific Northwest. Let's fucking go. Come on. I got nothing to add, <laughs> right? And you know what? You know what I'll add? He probably thinks he'll fucking truck you too. So maybe he'll sign on the dotted line. There aren't that many fights that would make sense for him. And you laid a great foundation for it. I knew it made some sense because of the geography, but I didn't know it had those type of layers to it. Yeah. Um, but when I look at sort of the top 15, I do think there are there are fights and there might even be fights that you want to potentially get back at some point in time. You know, yeah. we talk about Bilal and how for Sean Brady, for example, that result is big for him that Bilal is now the champion. But you're back in the mix in a big way. Um, so what does life hold for you now uh, over the next few weeks? I'd imagine, you know, that that gentle art jujitsu would be something you wouldn't now do for the next month or so to try to protect your back. Yeah, well, I mean, my back's not the problem at this point. I tore a ligament in my thumb the first, very first sparring session this camp. Oh. I, I ate a kick to my thumb, and I felt the back of my thumb touch the Velcro strap Ooh. on my glove, and I didn't take the time to look. I just pulled, pulled my thumb, got it back in place, but I tore a ligament in my thumb, so I had to navigate with kind of one hand for a while. Um, so I got to get that checked out. I think it just needs rest. I don't think I'll need surgery. Um, so I got to make sure this guy's good. So no jujitsu. For now, but I'm, I'm going to stay, you know, I want to stay busy. I want to stay in shape. Um, my goal is to fight either January or February. I like that time frame. It gives me enough time to get my snowboarding in thereafter. Yeah. But from now, I'm going to the desk on Thursday. So I'm right back to the desk. There you uh, go. August 10th. Back to the desk, August 24th. I'll be doing Rhodes UFC the 24th as well. Got to get my three-day Dave Matthews concert in at the end of September. Yes. And then uh, one commentary gig in Canada for BFL. My teammate Ashton Charlton's fighting. Remember that name. This young man is a very, very special up and comer out of our gym. If this guy, he, he gets to the big show, he's a guy that's going to have some highlight reel knockouts. He's been a big ace up my sleeve. When I think about fighting guys like Leon Edwards, anybody that's a striker, I got a phenomenal striker in my gym. This kid's going to be making waves soon. So I got to go call his fight in Canada. And I think once I get through that, then we'll start figuring out what's next. Nice. Busy man, but you're married to the MMA game. That's why it's amazing. A guy who watches every other fight reluctantly now watching his own tape. And shout out to Uncle Joe Carella and everybody else. Team Kiesa getting it done. Uh, I'll send you my address, buddy, for the T-shirts. But we wanted gotcha. to celebrate you today. Congratulations on a big win. And uh, we will see you maybe uh, January or February. But enjoy the time off and stay, stay safe on the snowboard, brother. Yes, sir. Thanks to you guys. It's a pleasure to be on. Kenny, always a pleasure to talk to you. John, I'll just stuff the shirt. Um, with your stuff at the apex. I'll bring it with you. Yeah, me. just shove it in my fucking dressing room. Love you, buddy. Enjoy <laughs> the fruits. Thanks, Congrats, guys. bro. See Thank you. you. There he is. Michael Maverick Kiesa, still getting it done. Won the Ultimate Fighter Live over 13 weeks back in 2012, as Ken Fowell knows. And uh, still getting it done, you know? And that's a big win. And, dude, you don't want to be the guy who loses to the guy who's lost seven in a row, right? right? This is professional sports, right? So if I just bear it down to that, Right, Ken Flo? I mean, yeah, there's a ton of upside and opportunity to go submit Tony Ferguson in Abu Dhabi on the main card live on ABC. But you get extended by Tony, who's 40 right. years old. You know, even if it's just vintage Tony and he has this amazing performance, it's like, you know, that fight and that acceptance of that fight was not without downside. And Kiesa obviously emerged with, uh, with flying colors, so. Absolutely. Pressure with that responsibility. He actually kind of added some to it based on his... His performance, you know, he wanted to see him perform in a right, very certain right. way. And I think that's really smart as a fighter because, again, you do not want to do this casually. And he understands how dangerous this is. He came up with a great win, looked great in the process, and uh, he seems like he's in a really good place, man. I love Kiesa, just one of the good dudes in this sport. All right, now with us on the guest line, dear friend of mine, and good to have him on as we inch closer to the NFL season. It just feels fucking good to say that. The football proxy king. I'm good at giving out nicknames, Maddie. Maybe that's your new nickname. The like football it. proxy king, 
Matty Simo, footballcontest.com. My man, it's good to see you. Good morning. Good to How see you guys doing? too. Yeah, so we're five weeks out from uh, the start of the season. That's pretty crazy. The summer flew by. And uh, yeah, we're, we're rocking and rolling, uh, getting our signups done. And I know you're aching to get out here and get signed up as well. Yeah, I have a lot of anxiety right now because I don't have an actual date in Las Vegas yep. on the books before the deadline, which is September 7th. And we will get into the football handicapping contest and all of that. But I have participated in these contests since like 2012 or 13. And right now, I don't have a date on the books to Vegas, so we got to change all of that. But, Maddie, your service allows people like me. I live in South Florida, but certainly people who live internationally who are listening to us and watching us and people who live outside of the greater Las Vegas metropolitan area to be a part of all of this. So can right. you just sort of explain what these contests hold and, uh, you know, why sports bettors like me want to try to cash in these things so badly? Well, it, it seems like it's easier to hit than the lottery, right? Because you feel like you know m more about uh, football than than anything else. And uh, yeah, it's just it's a grind, as you know, John and uh, Kenny. I don't know if you've been following these contests, but sixteen million dollars guaranteed in the Circa Sports Million and Circa Survivor contest. Ten million alone in the Circa Survivor. So if you want to get in that Circa Survivor contest, you're, we're looking at over eleven thousand entries, which. Uh, projects to uh, over $11 million. So the guarantee is one thing, but it's really by the number of entries. So uh, the Circa Million needs to hit 6,000 entries to, to, guarantee, to uh, make sure that Derek Stevens doesn't come out of pocket for, the, for that yeah. that he has the last couple of years. That's always a, a fun marketing spin for him, um, trying to get people out here at the last second to sign up. But what we do is we put the picks in for you. So it's one thing to sign up. Right. We, had, uh, we had somebody from Germany come out, somebody from England. We, so it is an international contest, like you were saying, John. There's people from all over the world that want to get into these contests because they are the biggest in the world. So in terms of the survivor, Kenny, I don't know if you know about this, but essentially NFL – you pick one team just to win, but you can't pick that team again all season. So oftentimes you're submitting a pretty chalky selection, a big favorite, maybe at home in a good scheduling spot. So the last time Ken Flo, I did the survivor entry, right? Thousand bucks for the season, right? Eliminated week one. So um, <laughs> I don't know. If I, what's that? Yeah, I no, I was a tough one. There was a lot of carnage early on. I think uh, only half the field was left after the first month. So yeah. it, it happens like there's big upsets all the time. People thought, hey, we're going to fade the Houston Texans last year. So we're going to go against them every week. By midseason, they're a playoff team and you're, you've lost uh, two thirds of the field. So it's crazy how it happens. But uh, every year there's teams that surprise that you think are going to be, be uh, worse than they are. And same thing, better, better teams. And there's upsets every single week, as you know, John. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been hearing John talk about this for like nine or ten <laughs> years now. It's insane. What does he need to do to cash in one of these things? Oh, he's oh. come close. I mean, he's had some uh, some good years. I, I think uh, a few years ago, right? He, he did pretty <laughs> yeah, well. In the yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. You know, close. But no cigar, right? I mean, I think Kenny wants me to just say on a hot microphone that I've done this contest for 12 years and I've yet to cash. Is that what you want me to say, Kenny? Is that what you want me to say? It's not a gambling show, right? It's an MMA million, podcast. Man. What's that? I, I want you to win $16 million. I'm one of your buddies, That's right. right? I mean, So yeah. does Maddie. I think yeah. Maddie wants me to win. I think he roots for me as much as any of the people that he does this service for. So real quickly, Maddie, Survivor. And then also the contest that I prefer, you pick five games against yep. the spread every week, a decidedly difficult exercise in the NFL. And how many people who participate in a broad scope usually cash? Well, so they, uh, Circa Million pays out 100 spots. Um, okay. So the, the top 10 are uh, going to get six figures, which is nice. The, uh, the winner for the Circa Million gets the million dollars, hence the name. Right. And you're going to love this one, Kenny, but if you do really bad and you're the worst uh, for the whole season, you win the booby prize for $100,000. So we've actually really? had a couple clients that have done that. Um, and it, it's it's funny because it's really up to how you start the season, right? So if you start yeah. the season, say, one and nine, um, things go south, um, and you're a good handicapper, what you can start doing is just fading your picks that you would pick normally and try to go for that. So yeah. you guys, I think in both cases that we had the booby prize winner, they went, they had a couple entries um, and went opposite uh, of what they thought they were going to do after they got off to the bad start. Um, we had the first guy that won it. He had two entries and he cashed in the regular uh, um, contest. 
won like a few thousand dollars, but his other one was so bad because he got off to the bad start that he won the hundred thousand. So that's another fun thing to play for. They do have quarters. So John, you catch fire for yeah, three, right. four, five weeks. You, the super contest pays out every three weeks, every six weeks, every nine weeks. That contest is the one that really needs a boost. Cause I know you, you kind of uh, have that one uh, close to your heart being like the, the OG of the football contest. And oh, um, gosh, yeah, so the OG of the guys who don't cash in the football contest. <laughs> but no, last year we had back to back five and O's. So we had and a stretch where we hit win some money, 10 straight so. games. Yeah. Yep. And then we fell firmly flat on our face on the canvas. We were, if we were upright, we'd be twitching on the canvas, looking up at the fucking <laughs> lights because the NFL gave us such a spanking. And it to me sounds like such a mess, right? Getting off to a one and nine start and then trying to like fade myself, you know. I guess there is some enjoyment in all of that. Footballcontest.com at football contest at Vegas underscore Maddie. Essentially, if somebody wants to, as a UFC fan or an NFL fan, get into this contest, they gotta get their fine asses to Las Vegas between now and September 7th. So if they are going to the Sphere show or maybe they're seeing Canelo Alvarez, gotta get out there a little bit early, right? September right. 7th is the deadline. And then once they sign up, you take it from there. That's right. You pass the baton to us. We're the middleman between you and the casino. So we're the ones physically submitting these picks every week. And that's the, the legal ramifications of everything. That's why we're allowed to do what we do. It's, it's not betting. It's not considered betting. That's why proxies are allowed is the, the lines are set. So the lines don't change throughout the week. Whenever they come out Wednesday and Thursday, that's what you get. So that's what kind of allows us to do what we do. And you submit them on the website and you get a nice email uh, back from us saying, hey, your picks are in. You can sleep easy and uh, yep. hopefully win some money. But um, it's it sounds a lot easier than it is. Um, the, the hard part, as you know, John is picking the winners. That's, uh, that's, yeah. that's the toughest thing to do. And yep. um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens this year. But the super contest, I just want to let you guys know, is in danger of going below a thousand entries for the first time since 2012. So that, I think that's around the oh, time wow. you got involved. That yeah. contest has kind of gone down this way while Circa has gone up. So we're trying to promote them as much as possible. They're having Super Contest weekend, August 16th and 17th. We'll be set up in the clubhouse there from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Friday and Saturday. Then Circa is having a big weekend in uh, two weekends, August 23rd, 24th. They're also having a watch party uh, for UFC 305 on August 17th, I believe. So there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of sports are starting to kick in with preseason and everything. And uh, it's a great time to get to Vegas and sign up. Nicely put, Matt. Yeah, people are flocking to that Circa contest. The Westgate Super Contest is the OG. It is the original. But we just want to support all of these initiatives. Footballcontest.com. And uh, special offer for our listeners and viewers today. If you sign up with Maddie. And you say you heard this conversation on the Anakin Florian podcast. We are going to pay for your service to be premium. So you pay for the proxy service and then the Anakin Florian podcast will take care of the rest so that you can submit your picks as late as possible. Like sometimes I try to do and I get cute with it. And then I submitted a, a one, one and four or an O and five. All right. At v v Vegas, Maddie at football contest and uh, September 7th is the deadline. By the way, your, your bio also says Vegas Raiders fan and Vegas Golden Knights fan. So what are your uh, what are your expectations for the uh, Las Vegas Raiders oh, here this man. fall? Not, not good. I mean, they have no quarterback, right? So we were hoping Brady was going to come out of retirement, uh, yeah. forego that ownership for a little longer. So right. he, had the, he had it all set up with Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer to be his Gronk and Hernandez. Uh, yeah. So it didn't it didn't uh, work out that way. We're stuck with Minshew and and O'Donnell right now. So or O'Connell, sorry, I can't even remember the guy's name. But uh, huh. yeah, Aiden O'Connell. But it looks like Minshew's kind of ed edged up there. Their defense is going to be awesome. There's no doubt about it. But yeah. you're competing against the Chiefs in the division. I mean, I don't know. And, and all those high scoring AFC teams. I mean, we're right there with the Patriots for probably the worst offenses in the league, right, John? Oh, this guy, a little shot on the way out. I know there's Patriots love inside his actual household. And you know, <laughs> well, yeah. 98 Brady, is going to bring love. it. That's, that's different. Yeah. Brady love. Yeah. You know, 98 is going to bring it though for the Raiders and keep them uh, competitive. Uh, all right, Matty uh, Simo at Vegas. Matty, appreciate the time, buddy. And uh, I will Thanks, see guys. you at some point between now and September oh, I 7th. Know. Uh, I know. Sign I'll up. see you soon. All right, buddy. Thanks. Thank you, my man. Appreciate it. My man, Vegas Maddie, with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. We got to get on out of here. Thank you also to Michael Chiesa, to Ray Longo, to Brian Petrie, to our executive producer, Cody Merrow. And we're right back in your lives next Sunday, August 11th. We will recap the UFC fight night, Tabora versus Spivak 2. And then we will preview UFC 305. Actually, Kemflo is going to give you, I think, seven 
predictions for UFC 305 six days before the pay-per-view because uh, I got wheels up to Perth on Monday, August 12th. I don't know what to tell you. Last thing today, Ken Flo, in terms of cussing on the program. Philosophically, I don't know how you feel about swearing on the podcast. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I've obviously sworn a lot on today's program, as is often the case. So I have found that cussing in some part is a verbal crutch, right? So when we're talking to, to Maddie right there, and I talk about maybe fading my own bets, I could say, sounds like a fucking mess, or I could say, sounds like an absolute mess. So absolute, I think, is a word that I could use as a verbal crutch. And I bring this up in the context of a complaint I got from a dad, you know, who, uh, who says I'm cussing too much on the Anakin Florian podcast. Well, yeah, I think we get nice and relaxed over here. So we kind of have conversation like we would off the air, right? Like we're having a real conversation and, you know, we inject swears from time to time. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, in, in Boston, it's kind of a common thing, right? Would, wouldn't you say? So I think that that kind of comes out a little bit. And um, I guess maybe when we're getting a little too comfortable, we swear a little bit too much. I don't know. Well, do you swear in front of your kids? I do not. Right. I do not. Okay. I, I mean, not to say I haven't. Right. I have, but I, I try not to. So I think my wife would suggest that sometimes I go out of my way to swear in front of my kids, which is <laughs> not the case. But I swear gratuitously and without shame in front of my kids. My right. son is obsessed with the F word. He doesn't utter it. I tell him if you if you would like to swear and use the F, just come let me know and we could talk about it, you know. Right, right. But if you say it at school, you gotta, you know, see what they say about all of that, you know. But yeah, now it seems like at camp he's trying to like put kids up to swear, you know, because his dad swears a lot. But it is what it is. We gotta go. We'll talk to you Sunday. Thanks to everybody for listening, for watching. Tell your friends, tell your mom. We'll talk to you on Sunday. UFC three oh five fight week nearly upon us. Uh thanks to Ken Flo. Until next week, you'll later. Can't keep your hands on the bar, he's an open man, he's cornbread. Oh.